10.20, we will um, resume. And I see we do have quorum. Um, and just to make a note to the public and to um, council is that the uh, we hope have been resolved and we'll only know if we start back our proceedings in June. Start and then if they're not resolved, then of course we need to take another recess. So Councillor Weeb, you're on for questions of staff. Perfect. Thank you very much. The first question is, are we able to put a couple elements in the BBC um, so we can ensure that we can see if those services would work if we are looking at future sites like church parking lots and others? But was there a thought, because this is really a test pilot, to look at some of those services, even though they might be in the larger facility, to test some of them out, recognize as important? I think the, the recommended option before you today is, is, is uh, cost effective just in terms of the efficiencies found in the congregate setting and, and really offers an opportunity for us to evaluate that model. Um, so I, I would I would recommend that just within, within budget that we need to use other sites. I mean, in our market sounding, we did do a call for land operators, builders. Um, how we might bring all of those different um, pieces together in, in, in um, and, and uh, this is the, the kind of the purpose of the in terms of delivering and Okay, and in the report, I really wrote down the ADUs and all the different parts of the and alternatives and what we today. I appreciate it. Uh, can you explain a little how do it fit in but not in a long term solution thing, but can you talk about where in the community would be Um, it's definitely improvement from um, sleeping outside. Um, security and the way that we'll walk um, and, and the benefits of having the meals that the folks can Um, uh, our, our, uh, typically, all of our, our shelters, our temporary shelters, are low barriers. So they allow people to come with pets um, and uh, with carts and their storage for belongings. I think one of the benefits for th this model is that it could support couples. So I know that that's a challenge in some shelters is uh, finding um, access uh, for, for couples wanting to do a shelter together. So this, this model could serve that need. Together. Yes, and some shelters offer, offer space for couples, but, um, but, but not all shelters. So um, this would support that need. Um, do we also see this as an opportunity for a, a parent or families? Would, it be, would there be some that could house a parent in the shelter? Or is that not an option? Um, in terms of um, and obviously, if there's a parent with a child, um, we would very quickly want to work with them to find um, a, a more permanent, um, secure um, housing of some form that we would prioritize that as opposed to, to putting them in this unit. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much for this work. Thank you, Councillor Weeb. Uh, Councillor Dominato. Oh, sorry, Councillor DiGenova. Thank so much. I'm just I'm wondering if we have um, if we have an answer to the question I'd left off with, so I don't have to ask it again. I think so. The answer to your question is uh, that the costs are considered cost, so really are for the provision of the twenty 
head and staff support will be required. And then the other 20 percent is inclusive of the maintenance required to serve the shelter structures, maybe extra. It's enough to amount to again that we are basing the budget on the market sounding kind of the range um, we found. So we will be working with procurement um, on that process. Okay. So it will be two year, um, $1.5 million. So I'm adding this up here. Um, request equates to $6,250 per, per tiny shelter space per month. Um, can you comment on the cost and effectiveness of that, considering I'm looking right now on Craigslist and at market condos that are renting at far less for that, um, that are, are fairly new or of a greater effect? Councillor Brooke Millis. So the, we would look typically at the operating costs separately from the capital costs, and the operating costs for these units are uh, approximately 2600 per bed per month, not units, pardon me, beds. And so those actually fall in line with the, with the cost of uh, provision of 24-7 supportive shelter provision. Have you contacted BC Housing to see if they, um, if this would be supported in their model? We have in, in future years be able to fund that considering, um, I mean, the exorbitant cost of $6,250 per month. Would they be willing to do that again? So, as Selena mentioned, we are in conversations with the province around this project. They have expressed um, interest in the project but are not able to commit to funding at this time. But we will continue to engage with them. Does this match up for the operational funding? At, at the comparable numbers that I just mentioned? Does that match up to their other numbers of what they currently fund? Brooke Mellis. Comparable so, space. So sh shelter, for the operation of shelter, I would say that yes, it does. Um, we didn't ask specifically for an entire, um, you know, the, the capital piece.
not necessarily be available uh, question so I, I, I think that the manager will get back to you with any information that you do have and we'll move on. So, Dr. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead, Councilman Mendez. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, I just have a couple of follow-up questions uh, with respect to um, the funding component. And one is to start with, uh, with the existing shelters that we have in the city. Could staff just elaborate on how those are largely uh, funded um, in terms of operating and capital? Um, Let's focus on maybe operating at this point. Operating these housing funds, uh, shelter operations. Are we funding any shelter operations ourselves right now? We are not. Okay, thank you. Um, and then, um, just for context, I just want to follow up on a point that was identified around the, um, the proposed operating budget here being in line uh, with um, existing shelter operations. So, is, is that fair? Flag coming forward with any of this from a, from a planning and development perspective. Absolutely, um, I'm, I, I don't. I'm not sure if there's someone planning here, but we did work really closely with uh, DBL with PDS um, on on all of the various options, and the one that we're bringing forward today um, is 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 uh, considered an allowable use under zoning development bylaw in terms of a, a shelter use. Um, and and we are working with uh, with our chief building official and fire around some of the uh, the building code and and life safety features. Um, I think uh, larger self-contained tiny homes uh, would require more extensive regulatory changes uh, to our land use and our zoning zone bylaw and our building bylaw. So um, this pilot will will assess kind of the outcomes uh, based on a, a shelter model, um, and following that, we would report back if there is a recommendation to to expand or or look at different different forms of of these tiny structures. Okay, great. Well, I look forward to that in Q4. Uh, hopefully, look forward to a successful vote to approve this pilot today. Sure, I'm wondering if there's somebody else on the. We have a speaker. Oh, great. Okay. Thank you, um, Councillor Fry, and seeing you're the last person on the queue, we'll be able to um, uh, hear from our speakers before we begin. Um, I'd like to remind speakers that they have five minutes to make their comments, just with their report or resolution of the recommendations, and may only speak once. Council members have up to three minutes to ask questions to speakers. However, speakers are under no obligation to respond. I'll also ask if speakers are residents of Vancouver if it's not indicated on the speakers list. And then finally, on um, each item, we will go back through the list for those who are present when their name was initially called. And I also want to note the City of Vancouver's long-standing commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion, including utmost respect for all genders. I remind Council that when addressing speakers and staff, we will avoid using gender honorifics and will instead refer to the person by first and last name, role, or title. So our first and only speaker to this item today, registered speaker, is uh, Jin Zhu. I believe... Um, Hi. Yes, okay, we can hear you. Um, if you have five Thank minutes you. to speak to Council, please go ahead. Yes, yeah, so my question is I'm here asking as an interpreter. 
reminder, um, the owner of the property in proximity to 875 Terminal Avenue. So in regards to the tiny homes and shelters project, his main concerns relate to the increase of people living in the predominantly industrial area. As a result of the increase, we encountered various attachments that spend the night this property even when they lost they jump over the dumpster. million to create 10 uh, units of housing that may be only occupied by one person or one couple at a time, taking in the high operational construction costs, or would the funds um, be allocated to established facilities that may hold greater capacities uh, at lower operating costs, therefore taking in more of those without shelter? Okay, um, so I hear that you've got a number of uh, questions. So um, we, uh, you do have questions from Council Di Genova. We can't directly respond to your questions. <coughs> Councillor Swanson, yeah, no if problem. you wouldn't mind just going on mute. Uh, can respond directly to your questions, of course, but you do have questions from Council Di Genova and uh, any councillors can pose your questions back to staff at the time um, that that is allowed. So Council Di Genova, you have three minutes to ask questions of speaker. Thanks. I was just wondering if the individual that you're speaking for today that um, felt unsafe or um, has concerns um, has the ability to connect with um, our city staff to report concerns or has done that in the past or has the ability to share that with council either through you uh, writing an email um, or, or so our staff council and or um, has uh, the individual that you're speaking for today contacted the police um, when some of these things are happening if um, they um, are concerned for their their safety for the safety of yeah people I do neighbor. believe um, on him he has uh, contacted the police and I believe that he has actually installed his own safety measures such as um, Putting like barbed wire over the fence to prevent people from from jumping over, uh, so he has taken uh, action to it. Uh, but in terms of contacting the city about it, I don't think he knew that was uh, much of an option either. So, could, could I ask? Um, would you be willing to reach out to all of council? You can find our email addresses on the city webpage and just share a little more information as to what measures he's taken and or, or they've they've taken and then um, we could also connect um, them with our staff. Okay, no problem. Yes. Thank you very much and thank you for making the time to speak for um, someone else today. Can't speak for themselves. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much to the speaker. Uh, there are no further questions for you, but we appreciate you coming to speak to council. Thank you. Oh, Councilor Swanson, I see you've just added your name to the question queue. I'm not sure if the speaker is still on the line. Councilor Swanson, just uh, check that you're not on mute, but did you want to ask a question to the speaker or did you want to be on the main queue? I just wanted to move the motions, okay, the we're recommendation. Gonna, we're going to go back to the main queue here. And I see Unfortunately, see that Councilor Hardwick is. Um, point uh, of privilege, a point a, of procedure. Just a second, Councilor DiGenova. We were on question queue, Councilor Swanson, so you're you were on the wrong queue to move the motion. Sorry, <laughs> I do apologize that okay. that happened. Uh, oh, Councilor Hardwick has gone off the queue. So look, go ahead, Councilor Swanson, if you'd like to. Just um, a point of point of procedure, Chair. Councilor um, DiGenova, go ahead. Um, I, I was wondering. I know it's not in our procedure bylaw. It is customary that uh, you know the 
counselor who brought forward the counselor, motion to counsel. Counselor Dijanova, I'm just, this, this, is not I'm a, wondering this is not a count, this is not a point of procedure and we're just going to go. point of procedure, counselor Fry said counselor he'd like Fry to Counselor Fry is sitting in the wondering. chambers right okay. now and knows how to right. put himself on the queue. So we're going to leave it there and I just would ask that there are not going to be interruptions through our proceeding today because it's already been two. Please don't yell at me, especially and, on picture proclamation day, chair. Okay, I think what we're going to do is just allow the chair, the clerks, and counselors to conduct themselves in the way that they know how to follow the procedure bylaw, and that's how we're going to work today. So, over to Councillor Swanson. I move the recommendations. Thank you very much, Councillor Swanson. And see no f any further comment at this moment? Not now. Okay, so I'm going to move us to uh, Councillor Hardwick for a uh, debate in a uh, referral amendment. Great, thank you very much. So we're gonna move to an amendment queue and we do have that amendment. So I'd ask you to put yourself back on the queue, please, Councilor Hardwick, and you can introduce your amendment. Okay, please go ahead. Yeah, um, my, uh, I've been supportive of the notion of tiny homes uh, since I first heard about it. Um, but what I've seen in this report and in this pilot does not align um, with uh, what my understanding of how that tiny, uh, tiny homes uh, would be uh, really implemented. And this is going straight to a, uh, a, a vendor and a scenario that is uh, set to cost a lot more money than uh, was originally anticipated. So. Uh, I think it's not ready for prime time and I think we should refer it back to staff and ensure that we have senior government support if indeed we're going to pursue that because it was, as it was pointed out earlier, operationally BC Housing in the province has, has covered the cost and we're now being asked in this scenario to cover operational costs in addition to capital costs, which again, just do not compute to me on the basis of other um, scenarios that I've seen where we've been looking at, at 10 dwellings, for 10 dwellings to cost $10,000 uh, a year or to construct would be reasonable, but we're seeing million dollar price tags overall attached to this, and I, I just don't think it's ready. And again, um, might have felt different if we'd had a more thorough presentation around this, but I think we need to send it back and uh, see more work around it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hardwick. Uh, Councillor Fry to the amendment. Yeah, and, and with all respect to my colleague, I couldn't disagree more. I think that uh, we, as evidenced by the recent decision, the court decision around the uh, tent city and Crab Park, and the notion that, that there is not suitable housing available to relocate folks into, and that in lieu of that, we'll have to maintain tent cities, uh, we need to do things differently. Clearly, BC Housing and senior governments do need to step up to the plate on this, but I will remind council that in the absence, this pilot is to set the framework and the opportunity to potentially roll this kind of thing out with the support of senior government. Um, right now, if senior government was to turn around and say, yeah, we're ready to support this, we don't actually have the mechanism in place. We don't have the pilot in place. We don't have any of that understanding of how this would work. That's the critical importance of rolling out a pilot. Uh, this has been something that I've been advocating for since 2014. And um, when I first attended Dignity Village down in, in Portland, Oregon, and 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 Honest to goodness, I think that this is uh, uh, <laughs> this is something that has been successfully deployed in jurisdictions up and down the coast. Uh, I think we have to we owe it to our residents, uh, both housed and unhoused, uh, given the proliferation of complaints that we have about about the, the dearth of housing and the people living on the streets and what that means for everybody in our city. I think we need to try options. Clearly, the SRO shelter system is adequate for people's needs and the courts have literally that. Uh, so I think that this pilot needs our support and I'm definitely going to be advocating strong and hard uh, both as a counselor and in my role at UBCM for to see additional senior government support for this kind of thing but we need to move on it and I'm not prepared to refer this back to staff and see it wait till the next council maybe or maybe not. Councillor Swanson over to you. Yeah, I'm opposed to the amendment. There's this idea out there that the city shouldn't spend money on things like homelessness that have been downloaded on the city 
by senior governments like the province and the feds. But there's a huge uh, issue with theory, and that is if the province won't do what they should do, then who will? I mean, do we want thousands of homeless people on the street instead of hundreds? I think, you know, we just have to take the action that's needed. And in this case, we could get 10 to 20 more people into a cozy little room, and that's what we should do, and we should do it as fast as we can. That's it for me. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Kirby Young. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I'm a huge fan of, you know, kind of leveling a conversation sort of based in, in sort of facts, but just being clear about what we are supporting, what it's likely to result in. And so I've heard commentary around it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a million bucks, it's a million and a half. Let's be clear. Council is being asked to approve a million and a half dollars. 460,000 is capital, a million is operating. So when we've heard, for example, some comments, well, the units have ballooned, and I would like to see them be less expensive per unit also. I think that's been raised by some of my colleagues, but when we hear comments that the units have ballooned from 10,000 per to a million bucks, it's not that, it's 46 projected and hopefully less um, because a million of the million five is operating. Um, I've also heard some commentary and discussion on social media around the city spending a million dollars on this, and again, I just want to be clear that the source of funds is from the empty homes tax, which is collected by people not living in homes because we want homes to be that, to be homes for people. And the legislation around the empty homes tax stipulates that it must be spent on housing initiatives. So I, I want to make sure that we're very clear around perspective on that and the funds. Having said that, I do not think the city can the city cannot be, we don't have the financial wherewithal to be in the business of the operations of housing, but we do enable it because it's critical in our city in terms of providing land, in terms of regulation and policy, um, and some of those other pieces. And we need to partner with the senior levels of government to get that done. We also have a situation, and I might save some of these comments a bit for later, but we have a situation where we have, uh, at any given time, a couple of thousand people sleeping on the streets the knock-on impacts in our communities, not only for those individuals being in that situation, but in our communities is significant. Um, and we also have ongoing issues with parking encampments and legal challenges that are going to require us to think creatively and look at higher thresholds um, around what is suitable housing. And so I think that the city of Vancouver can play a role in terms of being creative and good partners with senior levels of government to try to put forward solutions um, that may be alternatives to traditional things like shelters that can augment um, some of the other housing options that we have for people that are at different points um, along the continuum. Um, and if, for example, we could more broadly apply this, I know land will be a challenge. I'm very realistic. It might be difficult um, to extend this pilot on a large scale. But if we could look at some situations where we could set up tiny home villages, for example, as opposed to park encampments, so that we're trying to um, both provide needed housing for people um, and not have the knock-on impacts in the parks. So the parks are out of use, or we're seeing the impacts on communities and different people. We see growing life safety issues in that situation the longer that encampments continue. Then I think that there's some validity in signaling to the province, and we've all agreed at different levels of government to work together on tackling these issues, um, that we're willing to be creative um, and hopefully step up with the province and ministry around different solutions. So from that perspective, um, I wouldn't support the referral, but I do want to be very clear that I'm also not looking for the City of Vancouver to take on these operational costs. But again, as mentioned, the source of funding is EHT, which is specifically to be spent upon housing initiatives. So for that reason, I'm not going to support the amendment. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Kirby Young. Councillor Carr. Uh, thanks, Chair. I'm going to ask if you would rule on whether or not this uh, referral Amendment is out of order um, based on Section 8.7F of our procedure bylaw um, being dilatory um, or frivolous. And the reason being that in the motion itself um, that we are, are dealing with, um, if you look to recommendation C, it states that council staff to continue to work with government to a secure operating to implement the tiny shelter pilot project. So it seems like that duplicate, the language in the amendment duplicates um, the intent of recommendation C in the staff report. Thank you, Councillor Carr. I will uh, um, rule on that and I'll just take a three minute recess to deliberate. Be right back.
I'll um, provide my ruling on um, Councillor Carr's um, uh, request. And I actually would determine that this amendment is in order on the basis that it is the, the um, main part of the amendment is a referral um, and that um, staff uh, provide further consideration, generally speaking, on the pilot and the report. And then, of course, it does uh, speak to ongoing staff request funding from BC Housing and the federal government um, prior to bringing recommendations back, which is distinct from what is in uh, recommendation C. So um, that is my ruling that this amendment is in order. Okay, then speaking to the amendment, um, I will not be supporting the amendment um, and I will not support it because it is in fact a pilot. Um, and uh, it is, this pilot was brought to us by, by staff actually considering a member's motion. Um, so that they, this is already in essence, a report back on a motion. And I think it's just time that we got you know, a, a pilot going so we can have further analysis and better information upon which to make decisions around expanding such a program. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Councillor Carr. Uh, Councillor Di Genova, three minutes. You have five minutes to the, re to the amendment. The referral. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, many council members here, I think we all came together on looking at different forms of housing. I didn't realize that that meant that we would be on the hook for the operational costs and that we would be downloading costs onto ourselves. Um, as far as I can see in this report, although there's been conversations, there has been no formal ask to the province to fund this in its entirety. And I don't think that's fair. It's not saying that the province won't fund this or won't fund a similar model, um, but I don't know that right now because we haven't asked them. Um, many council members here encourage staff um, to not further explore in board um, bedrooms in Vancouver. You know, the bedrooms that borrow light from a window inside them from another um, window in a home because they thought that that wasn't humane for a family to live there when some families are using large closets as bedrooms for their children right now. Um, but these same colleagues are willing to vote on not tiny homes, but tiny shelters that don't have a cooking space or a bathroom, but come at a price of 6,200, actually, no, let me, let me get the exact number here. It's 6,250 dollars a month for each of them. Um, you know, to Councillor Kirby Young's point that this is coming from the EHT and that we have a lot of homeless people on our streets, um, taking 10 of them off won't even make a dent. But I think with $6,200 a, um, a month per tiny unit that we have here, we could probably stretch that and do a lot more um, with our land and with modular housing and with other options. Or perhaps there's, there's the will for BC Housing to come into this game with the federal government as well to look at other options for tiny homes that include bathrooms, that include kitchens, that include a community, um, that could be a shelter or could be transitional housing. Um, but that's not what this is. So I do appreciate the referral back by Councillor Hardwick. And you know, many of my colleagues who've just spoken against these referrals back on, on members' motions have referred back many other member motions on their reports back. So I'd just like to remind you of this, but this is signaling something different. This will be our council deciding to download onto ourselves operational shelter and housing costs. We will be sending that message and I am very concerned about the ramifications in the future, especially considering I believe that we actually have a good relationship right now with the province, maybe even better this council um, at the political levels, considering the political will and the work that we did together um, on the phone with Minister Eby when we did say that we would move forward, but we do it together. And I don't see this as moving forward together. I see this as an experiment, which it's been called by the Globe and Mail. And Considering um, my work 
in non-market housing, non-profit housing, working with vulnerable people, um, whom I worked hard to, and work hard to provide uh, housing to at three hundred and seventy-five dollars a month, and that that's informed my some of the reasons that I ran for council to make housing more affordable in our city. This isn't the way. This isn't the way, and we could help more people. Um, we also have to stay in our lane and this isn't our lane. So I appreciate the fact that Councillor Hardwick's referral leaves the door open to us supporting this and working with BC Housing. But if this, if this referral fails, we essentially will be taking on costs. And yet again, as Councillor Kirby Young and I have both said, taxes have gone up 20%. So we can say this is from the EHT, but we could better spend the EHT. We could be more frugal with the EHT and do more for the people who live in the city of Vancouver, working with our partners at the federal and provincial levels. So I'm gonna keep this very high level because I appreciate the work staff have done. Um, I love researching and looking up models of housing and that's why I have on tiny homes from Portland to San Francisco to LA. I know why Obama's uh, housing director and advisor suggested against that. I would hope that each and every one of my council colleagues does too before you make this decision. Thank you. Councillor Hardwick. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to elaborate a little bit more uh, further to some of the commentary that I've heard from my council colleagues. Unpacking this uh, million and a half in round numbers, just so everyone understands, there's uh, half a million dollars attributed to building 10 tiny dwellings. Um, that's uh, well in excess of what research showed they could be built for. That's the capital part, the half a million dollars. Do the math. Divide that by 10. That gives you, in the order of magnitude, $50,000 per as opposed to $10,000 per. So it's five times as much for the same thing that we're seeing in other jurisdictions. And then the million dollars on the operating side of things, which is not our responsibility and is downloading, is over two years. So that means $500,000 per year um, in operating expenses for these 10 units. Now, if that's staff time, how many employees full-time, um, how many extra employees full-time are we hiring to do this? Um, and then uh, the other costs that would be, are we um, feeding everybody? Uh, what else is coming with it? But half a million dollars a year to, for two years to service 10, 10 100 square foot units in addition of the cost of building them in the first place is a very expensive experiment. And I, I don't think that was the intention. I, I know that council's intentions are good with respect to tiny homes, but um, and, um, I just don't think it's ready for prime time. It should go back and be further refined. Uh, and uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Kirby Young. Yeah, thanks. I feel compelled to add a couple of other comments. And yes, I wish it was less. And yes, it seems expensive. And yes, we have to be careful stewards of taxpayer funds. But And, and I hope that the final cost will be less than $46,000 capital per unit. But it's around a half a million dollars to build um, sort of a room of some type, right? Whether it's SRO, whether it's contained with facilities or otherwise. So this is about a tenth. Let's hope it's less. But also look at the costs of people, not just in terms of dignity for people remaining on the street, but the downstream costs of police attending. We approved $2.1 million in street cleaning grants yesterday. I think it said in there there's about 13,000, um, I don't know how you describe it, but um, units of human feces that were quantified and collected. Um, and not only did the impact of the financial cost, the impact of the impact I think we have to be creative because what we're doing now is not working. So we can throw up our hands um, and say, let's take more time. Or we can throw up our hands and say, well, we should have longer term housing. But meanwhile, we have the issues right now. Um, I would. I participated in the homeless count two years ago and walked around. I would venture to say we haven't done one for two years, that it has not gotten better. I think we all know that. Um, but really, I think that we have to look at this a little bit holistically, and I want to be explicitly clear. I do not support the city paying ongoing operating costs, but I do support us trying to figure out some creative ways to make these 
solutions or to come up with solutions and make them better and send very strong signals to the senior levels of government that we're willing to be creative and to try things and to partner. And we expect them to step up and fulfill their role and we're gonna try and do our best to do ours. So I just wanted to provide some context, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Weed. Um, yeah, I will be voting against the referral um, for the simple fact that those 10 couples, people, it matters to them. Um, it's gonna matter I know it's a what was said is a drop in a bucket, but to those ten people, this is going to be a huge component um, of their lives. It's going to lift them up. This is going to support them. The operating funding is supporting is full supports for people that need supports. This is what we ask for. We ask for solutions. We ask to challenge the status quo. I think this report has a lot of amazing elements and different solutions that aren't ready yet. This is one of the areas that is ready. Um, and to stall this when we have people on our streets, the most vulnerable, um, do not have a place to feel safe. This will have an opportunity to have heating and cooling and all the elements we talk about needing to support the most vulnerable people in Vancouver. And stalling this will hurt those people. So for myself, I can picture the people that this will support. I look forward to welcoming them to these doors and I will not be supporting referral. Thanks, Councillor Weeb. Uh, seeing no one else in the queue, we can go to a vote on DIV referral. And that referral has failed with Councillors Carr, Fry, Swanson, Weeb, Boyle, Dominato. Kirby Young, Mayor Stewart, and myself in opposition. Councillor Hardwick, you still have the floor. Oh, that's a holdover. Councillor Kirby Young, to the uh, unamended. I'll hold, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Fry. Uh, yeah, and just uh, I, I do want to thank staff uh, for the work that's gone into this. Um, and just reflecting on, on yes, obviously we don't want to be paying for this as the city of Vancouver, and we are going to put pressure on senior governments to step up to the plate on 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 supporting this. Oh, actually, Chair, I see my timer was started at three minutes. You... I don't think I've spoken yet. I haven't, but in any event. Did you, did you make some earlier comments on the main no. queue to this report? No. No, okay. That's okay, I, I won't need the full five minutes anyway. I'll keep that in mind, thank you. I, I do wanna reflect that um, that I, I did have the opportunity back in 2014 to visit the Dignity Village in, in Portland, Oregon, and that's what had really started my interest in this work. And the most interesting piece for me was the, the results that it, 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 it had for folks. And you know, they had a, a bunch of, a similar construct with, with sort of outbuildings that provided showers and kitchens and that kind of thing, and small shelters uh, where people could sleep in and they could bring their stuff and they could lock their door and locking a door is something that we all take for granted but it really actually is a pretty significant piece of personal security and security of your stuff and just the dignity of housing that is provided in a, in a shelter cubicle that isn't provided in a lot of SROs and we've heard the courts loud and clear say that that the stuff on offer in the city of Vancouver not not through any fault of the city of Vancouver but the stuff on offer currently through BC housing is is not uh, not so substantial enough and sustainable. So we need to come up with other solutions. And what impressed me the most about Dignity Village when I visited there was that there was there was rules and there was community engagement around it and, and the, the, the time limit to stay there was two years. And the average stay was six months because what it expected to get their feet on the ground uh, and have a roof over their heads and, and get mail and get their ID and, and get all those kind of things that again, many of us would take for granted. Uh, and they got on their feet and it was a transition to more stable housing. I urge folks to check out the Pallet Shelter website. Those are the folks we brought up when I first introduced this motion and they came and spoke to it. And they provide these flat packed modular assembly huts uh, and they are rolling them out up and down the coast and the results are quite astounding. And they are a triage to better housing for folks. Uh, so folks aren't expected to live there forever. They are arriving there, they're getting stabilized, they're moving into more permanent housing uh, where they may not even need supports. Obviously what we're doing now isn't working. Uh, this is an opportunity to pilot something new, 
this is an opportunity for us to say, as a city, we're willing to explore these things, these new ideas, but we need that senior government support. And until we approve a pilot like this, we can't even put our hand out and say, hey, senior government, support us with this idea. So we need to move forward on this. Uh, time is of the essence. And I, and I just want to repeat that we had, I think, a pretty crucial blow coming from the court decision on Crab Park that we need to consider when we move forward on this, on this pilot because um, we, can't, we can't give up our parks uh, to become de facto encampments for folks who have nowhere else to go when the courts are saying that the, what's on offer is not substantial enough. So I'm uh, grateful to staff for the work that they've put into this, and I'm really grateful to see the sort of the change in, um, in, in the approach to this, where there was a lot of resistance to this idea a while ago. Now we're starting to come around to it as a potential, and I'm grateful for that, and I, and I hope to see this pass. Thank you, Councillor Fry. Uh, Councillor Boyle. Thanks, Chair Bly. Um, I, I will also be supporting the report. Um, and I just wanted to say, I've always felt a bit mixed about a tiny homes approach because I want our focus to be on more dignified long-term solutions. Um, I, I don't think tiny homes are a long-term solution uh, and they are absolutely better than tents in a park. Um, people need a place to go, and as we've heard, there are important benefits to uh, having a solid roof and a door um, that you can lock. Um, the real solution, of course, is full uh, is permanent homes with washrooms and cooking facilities in neighborhoods, in communities. Um, but doing this is uh, better than not doing this, and it will make a difference for those who get to move in. Um, I, I hear the conversation and challenge around us intentionally downloading these costs. Um, and I think it's important to note that we are paying these costs one way or another right now, whether it's in housing or it's in other forms of support uh, and public safety costs. Um, so I do think this is a worthwhile pilot. And uh, of course, it's as important as it's always been um, to continue to push for and support these long-term solutions like uh, permanent homes in within community across our city uh, so that people have somewhere stable um, and dignified to live. Um, and alongside that for us to be continuing to advocate lastly to senior levels of government to be uh, stepping up in their role to help us meet the gap that has grown over decades of underfunding uh, of adequate housing. So, yes, I think that this is uh, an appropriate step for us to take, um, but I don't think it's the full solution. And, and I hope that we continue to keep our eye on the real needs that we hear from communities, uh, that we hear from people who are homeless uh, and advocates, um, which is about permanent uh, self-contained units uh, and the supports that are included. I'll leave it there. I could go on a lot longer. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Boyle. Councillor Swanson. Yeah, I'm going to go for this too, even though I don't like shelters, I don't like tiny homes. I think everybody should have a good proper home. Um, but given what we've got, given what our options are, it's so important here we have a chance for 10 to 20 more folks to have a cozy place and a lock on their door. And without it, 10 or 20 folks won't have that. So I think we should go for it. Um, I am concerned about the costs. Um, what is it? 34 to 75,000 per person per year. Um, it shows what governments already know, which is that maintaining homelessness is more expensive than having housing. Um, and what we really need is proper housing for all precious human beings. And so I'm hoping we can work towards that. But in order to get the proper housing, we have to A, get money for it, then get rezoning for it, then get them buildings built and that all takes years and years so if we can get 10 to 20 places house housing for 10 to 20 people 
right now, I think it's our responsibility to go for it. So, yeah, that's it for me. Thank you, Councillor Swanson. Councillor Dominato. Uh, thank you, Chair. And um, first off, I'll just uh, say thank you to staff uh, for the diligence and work uh, and research into this proposal that was brought forward by Councillor Fry. Um, deeply appreciative of, of that work that's been done. And also thank you to Councillor Fry for initially uh, bringing this motion forward to Council. Um, I want to reflect a few things based on the conversation I've heard today and, and also anchored in, in my own perspective is um, I think it is not lost on anyone in this city um, that we are struggling with homelessness and that we have thousands of people, some are quasi sheltered, many are unsheltered, and that we have a responsibility as a society uh, to address that. Now, certainly uh, that takes all parties, all levels of government, and we definitely have uh, certain lanes to run in and different roles. Uh, but what I appreciated about this initial motion when it was brought forward to Council and, and the staff report is that it is a creative option uh, for looking at temporary housing. It's dignified and it's been deployed in other jurisdictions. Um, what I think proposed a two-year pilot I think is reasonable. Um, I appreciate that there's actually an evaluation component that has been built into this from the get-go. Get um, this is often a step that's missed in public policy work is the evaluation. We put things in place, but we forget to put in place a, a way to measure success and to know how it's working. I actually think there's an a, ability to scale this potentially uh, and also move from a tiny shelter model to more of a tiny home model as well. Um, but I, I also want to reflect on, um, on why this is important. Um, Councillor Fry uh, pointed to the ability to shut a door, to lock a door behind yourself. Uh, I was at an event a number of years ago now at the Woodward's building for a housing announcement. And I remember meeting a gentleman in the elevator there who um, was living there and said this was the first time he had been living on the street. Um, he had become a resident of the Woodward's building and it was the first time that he felt safe and in his life and he was able to shut the door behind him and lock it and felt a sense of safety and security. And um, I touched on earlier the fact that these um, homes or shelters will be able to sleep two people. One of the things we know is that many couples are wrestling to find shelter spaces together and often won't take shelter spaces because they can't stay together or they feel unsafe. We have a couple that's been living in Crab Park for months for those very reasons. There's also a couple in the Fraser child and get into some temporary shelter and then housing. And this will put them on a better way uh, in terms of including that for their child. And again, it's anchored in some of the real basics, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, what's important, having our physiological needs met and then feeling safe. And after that is that sense of love and belonging and being able to potentially um, have a temporary shelter space for couples or even in the case of a, an individual with a child um, is a real benefit and is offers the possibility of a better pathway forward, a better uh, ability to get to stable housing as Councillor Boyle was suggesting in her comments. And so I am supportive of this proposal. Um, I do want to see the provincial and federal governments support it on a long-term basis. So I look forward to the evaluation of it. I look forward to our staff applying for funds to support the operating. Uh, but I certainly think uh, we should be trying this out and I am supportive of it. And I, I thank again staff and Councillor Fry for bringing it forward. Thank you, Councillor Domineto. Councillor Carr. Councillor Carr, just uh, check that you're not double muted there. Thank you. Uh, I will be supporting this. Um, it is a pilot. And pilots, the intent of pilots is to test out a solution. Um, and I am really open to testing out solutions around homelessness. Um, it's a huge uh, as everyone knows, an increasing um, issue and emergency within our city. Staff are going to assess it. They're going to report back. We will learn from it. Um, they are going to seek senior government money. So um, I'm happy to see that embedded into their recommendations. Um, more importantly to me is that this is going to provide better shelter for some people who are homeless now. Not a lot, but for some. Um, it's 75000 to 150000 per um, 
that's less than some of the other solutions uh, that we are uh, pursuing around homelessness. Um, it is our money. Thank goodness we have the empty homes tax. I'm super appreciative that uh, that we pursued that as a city. And um, uh, some people have said, well, it should be all senior governments. Well, I agree this senior governments should up the ante, and they have this term compared to the on council. Uh, it's not as much as other places do. Some people say, look at Vienna, you know, look at Berlin. There's uh, so much housing. That money is not supplied by Berlin or Vienna. It is supplied by their senior government. Um, and so I urge the senior government to put more money into um, housing the homeless and providing decent places for people to live. For 10 to 20 people, this, including couples, has been noted by Councillor Dominato, this is, this is a better situation. There is increased dignity. There's increased privacy. There's increased safety. I think we've all heard the stories of women in particular who are, you know, are, are vulnerable men who just feel unsafe in the shelters that do exist. It's a place that locks. It's a place they can keep their stuff. Another thing we've heard so much about, people don't want to go into a shelter. That's why they're outside, because they have stuff they want to, they want to keep and, and protect. So I think this is, um, it, you know, thank you, staff. I think this is a good uh, start on what I hope to be a program that does expand into um, actual tiny homes, not just shelters. And in fact, places like Dignity, Dignity Village, which I too have visited and was very impressed by in Portland. Thank you, Councillor Carr. Uh, Councillor Hardwick. Thank you. The original thinking behind tiny homes uh, was in some ways similar to what we talk about when we, we look at aging in place. We know that seniors uh, downsize and, and want to stay in their communities. So there was a lot of talk about how are people that are being uh, displaced um, socioeconomically be able to stay in their own neighborhoods in their own communities. And so the notion of tiny homes and uh, growing in, in church parking lots and having the support of, uh, for example, faith-based communities uh, where they could access the, the um, washrooms and, and kitchens and, uh, from adjacent churches, for example, was all part of the thinking that went behind uh, the notion of, of tiny homes in the first place, very much as a community initiative. In this example, we're looking at putting it into an industrial area it was brought up by uh, the one speaker that we had today. And instead of, of seeing this as community support, we're seeing a million and a half dollars allocated to 10, 10 by 10 uh, um, units. This concerns me not, not because I don't think that, that homeless need to, to have temporary homes, and I've been advocating for this. But when I look at the, the, uh, the numbers that are being attributed to it, it seems like a pretty... You've got $75,000 per year uh, allocated to each of those people um, between capital and, uh, and operating. And so I just, I, I wrestle with the details, with the money and also looking at, at, at the purpose, which again I thought was supposed to be finding uh, room for people in the neighborhoods and the communities from which they uh, are, uh, you know, have been displaced. So I'm really wrestling with this because on the one hand, I support the notion of tiny homes, but on the other hand, when I look at this report, it's an allocation of a million and a half dollars that's going to give um, at 460, so round it up and call it half a million dollars from the capital plan um, to build the units, which I just still shake my head and cannot figure out why it would cost that much when the pallet homes um, that we uh, looked at in Seattle, for example, are $8,000 a unit. Even if they were $10,000 a unit, this is five times more for the built space. And uh, it seems like a good business to me. Um, and then when we look at, uh, we're giving another grant of over a million dollars to a housing society um, that's over $500,000 a year. And when I break that down and I look at that as headcount, people being hired uh, to do this work, it seems um, like a lot of money to me. Um, so 
again, what do you do when you, you s support a concept and you'd like to see it applied, but then when the application of what's being recommended is um, not aligned with that? So I, I hope people are, are thinking about that because if this, this is a very expensive pilot and it will set a precedent of the approach that the city is going to take to tiny homes going forward. And, um, you know, we have heard about the excess loading from the senior levels of government, and here we are again. And yes, we need to do something about it, but I'd, I'd like to see some more um, triaging done because Vancouver is becoming a destination um, from across the country, and, and we're saying, you know, that uh, the people uh, that that live here within our boundaries, the people that pay taxes and user fees and, and all that should absorb this cost. And it's, you know, I just shake my head of when it's going to stop. Do we want to help homeless people to, to get shelter? Yes, of course we do. Do we want to make sure that they have opportunities to, to get their driver's license or, or to be able to get um, to find jobs and and become mem you know active members of society. Absolutely, we want to 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 pull all pull out all the stops to be supporting people. But I think we still have to be discriminating in the way that we spend the money. And again, this seems like a very expensive way to test out something. And again, precedent setting for the future. So thinking about it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Hardwick. And last on the queue here is Councillor Kirby Young. Yeah, thanks. I'll be brief. Um, you have to start somewhere. Um, and when you start somewhere, it's not perfect. But what we have now is quite the opposite of that. Um, and if you keep doing what you have always done, you will get the same results, which is what we're doing. And it is not getting better. So I am supportive of looking creatively to try a change. Um, I think that we also have to be pragmatic, that pilots sometimes have limitations. I had a neighbor, um, my next door neighbor, the second that council was discussing um, a year or two years ago now, um, this hasn't happened overnight, and the second that council was discussing the idea of a tiny home shelter, she's affiliated with the church on the west side, um, and was immediately interested in learning more about it, and I connected her with staff um, to see if the church could offer up their site for this. Having said that, um, in terms of a pilot, what we have heard, um, and in terms of trying to minimize the cost and get something done in a quick period of time, is that you wouldn't have, the, unless you're building different types of shelters that are contained and have a washroom, for example, um, or other facilities, you wouldn't necessarily have access to the washrooms 24-7. Um, or to food services or otherwise. So I think that this is trying to take a bit of a realistic approach to demonstrating the form um, and to demonstrating how it could actually work. Um, would I like to see have seen more flexibility in terms of the different types of modules, which I think was suggested in the original motion? Yes. Um, and scaling it up? Yes. Um, but I'm also recognizing that if Council approves this report today by fall, six months away, Oh, we just lost your mic. Just oh, it's back. Um, I'm also recognizing that by fall, six months away, we would have this pilot up and running. And conceivably, it could be the same if it was five times as big or ten times as big in that period of time. And longer-term housing takes a long time to secure the land and the senior government funding and to get it up and running. And so we've got to have some diversified tools in our toolbox um, that are not just the permanent solution to move people along. And I know that's tricky for people because everybody wants people to be in permanent housing. Um, but this is potentially a transitional opportunity. Um, and it's, as I said, it's a whole lot quicker um, once we actually get going, uh, if we can just support this, uh, than it is to get those permanent units built. And one does not negate the other. I think that they support each other. So I'm going to support it for that reason. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kirby Young. Councillor DiGenova. I'm just going to check. Um, on the timing. That was on the referral, I believe, the amendment. No, the referral was on an amendment queue. 
yes, and I that I think my time has been held over. I haven't spoken once on the main motion yet. Yeah, I'm just checking with clerks on that. Okay, we're going to go ahead. Um, it does show that you've spoken for five minutes, but um, we'll allow you to continue, Council Di Genova, as we did with Councillor Fry. Go ahead. Um, if you could reset my time so I can see where I'm at, because I, we can roll the tape back, but I've only spoken to referral. Councillor Di Genova, um, just I, go ahead. I wanna, okay, I, I want to... Um, Okay, can you start my time so I can at least Councilor see? Councilor Nova, there is a slight delay between the system okay. that manages timers and your speaking. So just go fair. ahead and speak, and that's what's happening Thank behind you. the scenes, okay? Thank you. Just trying to be fair, Chair. Um, I, I want to appreciate the work that staff have put into this. Um, we certainly download a lot on our staff, especially our staff in arts, culture, and community service. And I don't want you to feel that I'm unappreciative of all of the work that you do because you do a lot of work and some of it I feel that you know there should be more help um, for you to be able to do especially um, at other levels of government and um, hopefully we can find a way to uh, work together and collaborate with other levels of government. I also want to appreciate because it was Councillor Fry who brought forward this motion and I did support it um, you know, staff going out and exploring this along with BC Housing. Um, I, I do appreciate the work that you put into this, Councillor Fry, as you and I have had conversations at the time. You know, um, I, I was very interested and in, in just um, uh, because of my own work in non market housing, had already um, looked into some tiny homes models and. Um, Although I hadn't visited, uh, as you had mentioned, Dignity Village, I have had the opportunity uh, to vis visit other tiny homes. Um, I think that we all agree. I can't think of a single council member um, or one of my colleagues here who doesn't agree that we all um, should uh, strive towards everyone in the city having dignified housing. Um, when I look at that right now, I see that being modular housing. Um, modular housing is carefully researched, it's thoughtfully developed, there's a partnership where we provide land and the province provides the modular housing, um, and and it's it's a proven funded model of housing. I've also heard from people uh, that are very excited to move outside of Vancouver, uh, that moved to Vancouver uh, either uh, because they were homeless and to live uh, in street homelessness, uh, in the city of Vancouver because there were more resources here, or they did that because of the fact that they they were hoping that they would find housing. And I, I completely understand, I'm not saying that they shouldn't do that, but when modular housing came on board, there was housing for them in their communities. There was housing for them in the places that they wanted to be outside of Vancouver. So I, I think that, you know, having a type of housing that's not just exclusive to one city, um, that we can level set throughout our province is really important. And I just think that it's been far too long that Vancouver goes at it alone, um, especially on funding. Um, you know, we're downloading these costs in my opinion, onto ourselves. And, you know, had we had the pallet model in front of us today for $8,000 a home, um, my decision might have been slightly different. Um, I think maybe I could have justified it, but the fact that we have public hearings where, you know, myself and, and some, of, some of my colleagues around the council table have said, you know, less than $6,200 for more square footage um, you know, is unreasonable for a home. I'm concerned at what we're doing by running out the door here and setting the level at $6,200 a month. Um, I'd, I'm concerned about where that will take us. Um, you know, unless we're trading responsibilities with BC Housing where they're going to pay for our sewer separation and we're now paying for housing, I'm not sure how this is going to work in the long term. I think that there are opportunities and I don't know that PC Housing has had a formal request. Certainly I know we haven't made one of council uh, for them to do this, for them to uh, take on the t tiny homes pilot. Um, I would have supported that had that come forward, but it hasn't. Uh, I, I think that we can find solutions for people who are homeless in our city. And, you know, to Councillor Weep's point, I think it's extremely important that we have 
options for families who hide. They live in homelessness in our city. And I've spoken to families that are afraid. They're afraid that their children will be taken away from them. I've reached out to our ACCS staff when they've reached out to me and they're frightened that their children will be taken away from them if they even admit they're homeless. So we have to consider who is homeless in our city, what options we're providing for them, but also that they're dignified options. And I'm not sure that, you know, and, and to another colleague's point about having, you know, a, a bathroom and a kitchen here, but on site, we've heard from people who live in SROs who don't feel safe walking down the hall to their bathroom. I'm not sure that people are going to feel okay walking outside in the middle of the night, especially women, to a, a bathroom. Uh, that being said, you know, it will be 10, maybe 20 people living here. I wonder if we could stretch that at looking at another pilot. But that once is your we time, Councilor Di Genova. That is your time I, at five minutes. I, I, so we're going to move on to Councilor Weed, please. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, I'm excited that Councilor Di Genova wants to spread this to more units because I do think this is exciting. We want to see this grow. Um, I really appreciate the work in the staff report, really talking about what it would be like to change and work that the staff are currently working on ADUs and tiny homes and other opportunities. Um, and this is just another one of the housing continuum projects that we need to do as we change our models to address the people in our city. Um, I love that it's gonna be culturally aware and trauma informed, that there's gonna be supports for people on site. Um, and that when you look at all the services provided, that this is a way to make sure that people are supported in their transition on housing. So I just wanna thank staff for all their hard work. It was a really nice report to read. There's so much information in there about what we can do here, but also about the future work that will be coming to us to address some of the other concerns we have. So um, I will be very supportive and thank staff for bringing this forward. Thank you, Councillor Weeb. So that brings us to the end of um, the debate. So we'll move to a decision. Councilor Di Genova, I'm not sure if you're. Thank you very much. So that motion uh, has passed with Councilor Di Genova and Councilor Hardwick in opposition. Thank you very much, Council, and thank you very much to our staff team uh, for answering questions and bringing this report forward today. So this does uh, conclude item three on the agenda. We'll be moving to our referred items from a uh, council meeting yesterday. We do have speakers present and we have about 25 minutes before lunch. So we're gonna move to um, here um, uh, to the three items. And um, I just wanna offer another reminder that if amendments are brought forward, they need to be submitted to the clerk in written form. And the first referred motion is item four. Previously, motion B2, local elected representation on the TransLink board, which was moved and introduced by Councillor Fry and seconded by Councillor Swanson. We'll now hear uh, speakers on this motion. Our first speaker um, on the public body representatives list is John Irwin, Commissioner, Vancouver Park Board. Just checking to see if John is on the line. John, are you there? John, if you're speaking, we cannot hear you just yet. Okay, we're just checking to see if there is, um, if we've got connectivity to the line or if uh, John, our first speaker, is not connected at this time. Maybe I could move to speaker two and we'll see if um, 
John gets back on the line. So Mark White, are you on the line? Not hearing Mark, I think we might have an issue with the line, so. Okay, well, I wonder if what we could do while we're connecting back to the line is actually we have two speakers in person. And if we can hear from them, of course, we have a two hour break after uh, between lunch and in camera. So if I may call on uh, speaker three, Connie Hubbs, who is a member of the Transportation Advisory Committee, who is here in person to please come into the chamber. And this is your opportunity to speak to council. So we're just giving our speaker a minute to come to the microphone. I get it. Good morning. Uh, Connie, you are up to speak to council, uh, so you can please uh, move to the microphone. And our staff team are just going to help guide you where that is. And um, you do have five minutes to speak to council. Uh, welcome. You can get settled there and start whenever you're ready. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to address council today. It's my honor to present on behalf of the Transportation Advisory Committee, I'm speaking in favor. TRAC approved this motion at our November 2021 meeting, and I think each TRAC member likely had their own reasons for their vote, but I'm here today to share my own motivation. Here's a quote, TransLink is a highly undemocratic body. That's a quote from transportation planner, Eric Doherty. One sign of the lack of democracy with TransLink is how poorly it's understood. I've, under, I've discovered that very few people in our community understand what TransLink is or how it works. This includes academics, former city planners, and our own residents. Many believe that it is a private corporation and not a provincial utility. It is perceived as opaque and unapproachable. Few meetings are public and speakers are restricted. The Mayor's Council, in fact, called on the BC government to reinstate democracy in TransLink as stated in this motion. The current appointed board has many professional and capable individuals, but their focus and past experience may be out of balance with today's needs. The majority are former corporate executives. Where are the transit users? Not surprisingly, TransLink does a good job of fiscal responsibility. They may do less well in making transit more attractive to users. Some of the actions of TransLink that, I, that rise to mind for me are raising fares during a pandemic, implementing screening procedures for HandyDart, and we got a partial win on that one, and cutting over 100 bus stops, which doubled or tripled the distance that we must walk to a bus stop. All these things discourage transit use. That's the very opposite of what we should be done. How is making transit less affordable and less accessible consistent with the Vancouver climate goal of cutting our carbon in half by 2030? Simply, it is not. In a democracy, we need to persuade as well as mandate. Two initiatives, one by council and one by park board, illustrate this, I think. 
The Vancouver Park Board added a bike lane to Stanley Park in 2020. There was significant opposition to it, up to and including a court challenge. Over 100 speakers lined up to oppose the bike lane as they feared limiting car access would deprive them of this treasured green space. Could we offer them a transit alternative? No. While the number 19 bus takes us to the entrance of the park, not since 1998 has the round the park Stanley Park bus made its circuit, stopping at all the major attractions. At a public TransLink board meeting, Commissioner John Irwin requested the return of the Stanley Park bus, this time using a hybrid or electric battery. This was quickly rejected by the Vice President of Planning and Policy for TransLink as an idea that is unfeasible for the foreseeable future. I believe if you take away car access, you need to provide an alternative. Vancouver is a very bike-friendly and walkable city, but not everyone can or will cycle to the park or is able to walk to attractions. Failure to provide better and more accessible transit is essential to change our dependence on cars. In this case, the commissioner is held firm and the bike lane remains. In response to the climate emergency parking motion, there was significant opposition that may have led to its failure. What if we had offered a viable alternative to car use here in Vancouver? It's all stick and no carrot. We need the carrot. Sadly, our current TransLink board does not seem to understand that. It is challenging to change, but change we must. TransLink cli TransLink's Climate Action Plan states that TransLink is committed to net zero GHG emissions by 2050 and within its own operations. Can our climate wait that long? A more accountable TransLink could be persuaded to act with more urgency, in my own opinion. A democratic TransLink could both plan for our region and tailor responses to local situations and challenges. Vancouver's population density provides us with the opportunity to do far more with active transportation and transit. We need the local autonomy to make local decisions. Please support today's motion and call on our provincial government to bring back democracy to TransLink. Thank you. Thank you very much, Connie. Uh, you do have a question from Councillor Boyle. Councillor Boyle, please go ahead. Thanks so much, Connie, for, for coming in to speak to this. Uh, and I appreciated you laying out some of the challenges, local and, and route specific challenges, just trying to wrap my head around how um, a, a few specific questions, how um, more elected folks on the board would uh, improve the way that TransLink is addressing those challenges. Yes, I think having elected representatives means that there's a direct accountability to the voters. And as an elected official yourself, uh, Councillor Boyle, I'm sure you understand that. Every decision you make has to be in line with your principles, but you also have to take into account public opinion. And uh, I think that at this point, you have a board that is, you know, filled with a lot of, of a certain kind of professional competency. And I think that may have been some of the rationalization initially, but what it's not, uh, uh, filled with is accountability to to citizens and transit users. Yeah. Okay. I appreciate that. Uh, um, is your sense that that more elected people across the region take the bus or or are regular transit users? Then, I guess I, I see local governments also failing on accessibility and failing on meeting our climate targets. So. I'm just grappling with the the proposed solution, um, whether the proposed solution is going to help us address those challenges. Yes, Councillor Boyle, I, I see your point entirely, and there's certainly no governance model that's perfect. One of the things that does give me hope, and it includes the motion that you yourself moved in Council in 2019, I believe, that we declare a climate emergency. There is more awareness, more acceptance now than ever of the urgency of addressing climate change. And 
I don't know if I adequately made the point, but I do not think that TransLink is engaged with that. And in particular, our particular city, and this is Vancouver City Council, so we, our domain is primarily the city of Vancouver itself, whereas the domain of TransLink, of course, is the region, Metro Vancouver. But we have higher transit use than in other places because the city grew up in, in a different way that depended on transit. And we have a dense population that supports transit use. So some people say, well, why wouldn't you actually spend more time trying to encourage suburban transit? And of course, we need to be doing that. But it's more difficult. It's much easier to do in Vancouver. But when you do things like cancel bus stops, when you do things like change services and so on, it doesn't encourage people to use transit. And we've got a big task ahead of ourselves coming out of this pandemic, I hope, uh, because transit uh, use has gone down dramatically and we need to win people back. And it's that focus that we need to have. And it's a focus that is based on reflecting the, the will of people. And I think the will of people at this point is to come up with accessible, fair and equitable uh, solutions. Okay, we're going to have to leave that, it there. That, that is the end change. of uh, Councillor Boyle's question. Thank um, you. You um, do have more questions though, Connie? Uh, Mayor Bly, can I just ask a, a point of procedure, which is just when it might be appropriate to move a motion to hear from the second speaker who's in person before we break from lunch so we're not having that person wait around another couple hours. That is your right to move that motion. I will just note that we do have five other speakers who have also been waiting on the line, including two that are public body representatives. Um, so is it your motion to hear um, the speaker who is in person um, right after the speaker is complete or after the yeah, VIP? That, that, that is what I'm proposing, just noting, of course, that, that they are already there at okay. City Hall. Great, okay, well, we do have a motion on the floor to hear from speaker three on the public list, Red Bass, who is in person. And so that is the motion. So uh, we'll just do a verbal vote. All those in favor, say yay. Yay. Okay. Any opposed? Okay, great. So um, I'm going to just then give some clarity to those folks who have been waiting on the line that we will hear from the one in-person speaker and we will come back to the balance of the speakers after in camera at two o'clock. Thank you for your patience on the line and we'll hear from you after two o'clock. Uh, okay, thank you, Councillor Boyle. And um, with that, we'll move to Councillor Dominato for questions of speaker. Uh, thanks, Chair, and, and thanks for coming in today. And I, in a similar vein to Councillor Boyle's question, um, I, I appreciate your comments around increasing accountability, but I'm curious if, if there was discussion by the committee about how that accountability might work with greater local representation in the context of uh, to your point, uh, issues affecting individual municipalities. And so um, we actually probably have some of the, some of the best uh, uh, public transit service in the entire lower mainland right here in Vancouver. Um, but how do you see uh, a new governance structure working to ensure that there is a balance to the decision making? Um, is it Vancouver's priorities over Burnaby's priorities? What about Mission? What about Pitt Meadows? What about White Rock? Some of those areas are very underserved. And so how do you see a new governance structure dealing with the diversity of, of needs? Well, thank you, Councillor Dominato, and there's no question that it would be challenging. One of the things that, that I'm encouraging uh, Council to look at is solutions that are more local, because it isn't one size fits all. If you look at the situation, even in Burnaby, our, our neighbor uh, just to the east, it, the community is laid out in a very different way. They're developing four major hubs with huge high rises and so on. Their transit needs and, and the way that they have to respond to them are not gonna be the same as the, the layout that we have in Vancouver. So I think if they allow there to be more local implementation of solutions that are locally appropriate, you're gonna get more take up and it's gonna be more meaningful and more accessible and, and citizens will be happy transit users. I know it's easier said than done, but I think we need to go there. No, I appreciate it. I, I, the, I absolutely hear you in terms of the, the diversity of our municipalities and the different needs, and, and it, it'd be interesting to see 
what other models might exist or it could be explored um, to ensure that local input. Um, but I'll, I'll leave it there. I appreciate um, the comments today. It's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Com Chair. Point of procedure. Yes, Councillor Carr. Yeah, um, Chair, could you just um, let me know if um, Councillor Boyle had moved to extend past 12 to hear the second in-person speaker? If no. not, I'll move that. No. Yeah, no. I, I would like to. I think, okay. I, think I, like I, I don't think it was very I don't think it was clear I think we focused on um, moving the speakers list around so if you'd like to move that motion to go beyond um, 12 that would be appreciated to hear the second in-person speaker yes I move that okay and questions to the speaker as well I assume yes quite thank you to hear and ask questions at the speaker thank you okay great so we have a motion on the floor all those in favor say yay yay any opposed yay. Thank you for that further clarification, Council Carr. I do believe it was Council Boyle's intention, but that's very helpful. Uh, Council Kirby Young. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, and thanks for being here to speak to Council. I have one follow-up question, and that was when the committee was discussing this motion and the composition of the TransLink board, did your discussion and the breadth of your discussion also include um, the Mayor's Council on um, Regional Transportation that's comprised of 22 um, individuals and elected representatives that provides input into the transit strategy? Well, I can tell you that the committee didn't discuss that because uh, given the amount of time for the motion, getting into the the weeds of the actual TransLink and Mayor's Council governance was probably beyond us. I think they were voting primarily, and I don't want to speak, as I say, for every, every individual. I'm an, a newish member of this committee. I only just joined in the last year. But I think they were mainly thinking, you know, it's a public utility, it's publicly funded, it, it needs public representation. So it was a vote for democracy. Okay, but would you say it would be important to consider sort of the whole construct and ecosystem around TransLink governance? Because you have, for example, you have Metro that does land use, you have a mayor's council that has 22 elected representatives already, and then you have TransLink that is comprised of roughly sort of half professional voices and then half, um, a couple of mayors, half professional voices, and then half of those representatives are identified and put forward by the mayors of the region. So do you think it's important that all those pieces are considered together? Well, luckily, um, Vancouver Council doesn't have to do that job. All you have to do is ask the provincial government to do it. And they're well aware of the structure because although the, this sitting government, the John Horgan government, did not create this uh, structure, that was done by a previous government, but they were on record as opposing it, and they are also on record of promising to dismantle it. And the Mayor's Council itself, as stated in the motion, specifically called on the, the present government to reverse that and revert to a more democratic process. So yes, it's a little bit complicated and I, I think that may be why the Horgan government hasn't got around to doing it because it's, it's easier to criticize what other people do and it's a little harder to implement a new structure. So, but that'll be their challenge. I think they're up for it though. I think they can do it. Do you think they intend to fulfill that promise or do you think it's just that it was a promise and now they're finding that it's more tricky um, when you're actually... That's why we're here today. To That's why I'm here today, <laughs> anyway. Uh, it's, it's because I think in, in a lot of ways, to be perfectly honest, I think sometimes it's easier just to let things be because, as you've pointed out, it's going to be some work to do that. It's not, it's not the simplest change imaginable. And so I think if they hear from Vancouver City Council and they hear from other city councils, and I'm already getting feedback from other municipalities, that this is really important to them. I think that'll be what pushes them to make the change. Without this, I don't think they will, quite honestly. Okay, thank you. Appreciate the comments. Thank you, Councillor Kirby Young, and thank you very much, Connie, for being here today. Those are all your questions, but we appreciate you coming in. Thank you so much. Uh, so based on our motion earlier, we will move to um, speaker number three from the um, public speaker list. And that is um, to hear from Fred Bass. And we'll just give Fred a moment to come into the chamber. Morning, Fred. Yes, that's exactly where you need to be. Um, welcome. You have five minutes to speak to council, and then there may be questions from councillors after you finished your comments. 
Please go ahead. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, you have a tough job, and uh, it's fun watching you. Um, and thank you for your courtesy uh, of uh, having me speak now. Uh, I do have a speech that I can't say in less, in less than seven minutes. So if I have to keep to five, then if you ask me a question about the report that I refer to, I can add the other two. So I'll, I'll have it either way. So here, let's get going. Thank you for this opportunity. I support the motion, and I make a cautionary suggestion. In this time of great uncertainty and great change, it's important that planning and operation of transportation, TransLink's function, needs to be well linked to local governance um, and to the planning of land use, which is municipal government. So I recommend that well-prepared elect elected officials gradually become, gradually become uh, members of the TransLink board, as was the case a while ago. On February 10th, a year ago, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities celebrated their many years of advocacy. The Prime Minister finally established a permanent transit fund. FCM's statement began, and I quote, it's no coincidence that the world's most dynamic cities feature some of the best transit systems available. Modern and efficient public transit increases productivity, cuts commute, commute times, and reduces pollution, all while attracting top employers and skilled workers. Transit services are also disproportionately relied upon by women, radicalized and indigenous people, students, seniors, and persons with disabilities. Quality transit creates equitable, vibrant cities and enables us to meet our climate goals. Note that FCM's statement is calling attention in its second sentence to what researchers call transportation poverty, people not having access, not having the resources to reach what is necessary in life. TransLink's mission and value statements show commitments to stakeholders, the public, employers, subsidiaries, and partners. However, unlike FCM's statement, there's no recognition of inequality, nor how quality trans, uh, tr transit can help to overcome it. TransLink's website describes the 11 member board, five members with strong skills in management, two strong skills in finance, two mayors, one community activist, and one with transit union experience. These folks do not require transit to get to work nor to reach their essential services. The two board members most closely connected to those who regularly use transit are the two mayors who, to keep their jobs, need the votes of transit-using citizens. The public election of six of the 11-member board would better represent transit users, though the meetings might be a bit more raucous. Cautionary suggestion. Since it takes knowledge, skill, and experience to be an effective board member, I suggest to Councillor Fry, Councillors Fry and Swanson, that to qualify for board appointment, nominees be required to have experience in council office, in elected office, and training in management, management and training in transit management. To maintain continuity bringing elected members onto the board should be part of the existing board's uh, succession process. Returning to what Prime Minister Trudeau did last February 10th, the good news is that the permanent annual funding, permanent annual transit funding of $3 billion for transit begins in 2026. The bad news is that uh, not much is uh, allocated um, 
in, in the interim. Fred, that is your five minutes. It goes very quickly. Right. Um, but as you mentioned, and you do have uh, questions from councillors, so we could start with Councillor Hardwick. Sure. Okay, thank you. Hello, Fred. Hi. It's been a while. Hi. Hi. Nice seeing you. Um, you mentioned that there was a report that you were referring to. It, would you like to um, help and, us How remarkable that? that you asked me. Thank you. Um, I, uh, yes. Uh, in preparing this statement, I learned that Canada commits more of our incoming uh, GDP, this is actually two reports, um, more of our GDP to fossil fuel development than does any other G20 nation. More of our GDP than any other nation. It provides $14 billion per year in public finance for oil and gas, both domestically and internationally. Surely we can harvest more than $2 billion per year. So I'm closing with a, a second report, and that is a 2020 study comparing 10 effective consolidated transit systems around the world, including Vancouver's, provides some expert commentary regarding Vancouver's transit system. In the final chapter, it concludes in rather academic language. It says, Vancouver, consolidation with a focus on the bottom line. Vancouver's, Vancouver's ridership uh, performance compared to other North American regions, their high fare recovery rate and their low subsidy per capita indicate there is some political tension among voters and decision makers between those who are focused on keeping fair recovery uh, rates high and subsidy taxes low, and those who wish to spend more on transit with the aim of boosting transit ridership and mode share. Therefore, it is intriguing to, it is intriguing to hypothesize what Vancouver's ridership would be like with their current consolidated regional transit system and a Stockholm level transit subsidy. So I'd like to translate that. Uh, more simply, Stockholm and other European cities' transit systems show that compassionate transit decision making and informed regional politicians can achieve a higher level of ridership in their communities and not necessarily at high cost. Having a, transit, a, having a TransLink board with strong representation of those elected by the people of this metropolitan area would help move TransLink's current focus from bottom line recovery of fare to maximizing ridership, which is needed as fossil fuel use disappears. So I recommend that well-prepared elected official, officials gradually become a majority of the TransLink board. Thank you very much. Thank you, and that is uh, Councillor Hardwick's time. Councillor Boyle, five minutes, or sorry, you have three minutes, question of speaker. Thanks so much, um, and thank you, Fred, for your decades of climate leadership. Uh, I really appreciate getting to hear from you now. Um, I, I just wanna clarify first, are you suggesting um, that members, mayors or local councillors should Compose the majority of the uh, uh, of the TransLink board, or that we, as a region, independently elect specific people to that board in our local elections. I'm sorry, I don't understand what you just asked me. It, are you suggesting a new elected position where we elect people directly to the TransLink board, or no, that no, 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 councilors? No, I'm suggesting that uh, slowly over time. Uh, councillors who have experience, uh, uh, well, councillors or, or even mayors who have experience, uh, get uh, 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 get uh, training and be ready to serve three years uh, when they're uh, hopefully reelected. So I would see uh, those uh, the board include. Uh, municipal elected municipal officials from you know from urban suburban and rural areas of uh, of the lower mainland of of the area so I'm not suggesting a separate election I'm su suggesting okay. a slow phasing in 
of what really existed uh, 20 years ago. In fact, I was a, for a year, I was a member of the Translink Board. Um, can I also ask, how would those members get so you know as well as the rest of us, lots of locally elected members are great. So how would the folks get to, well, to be trained and I, I, be on I, that board? I, uh, I can't give you a well thought out answer, but it would seem to me that I, I think it would be feasible to do it within the current framework of a screening committee with the stipulation that uh, if this actually happens, then the screening committee would be obligated to put as nominees to the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, for succession, uh, people who were uh, municipal councilors or mayors. So and, I, and I was, do you have was any... fitting into the present system. Okay. Do you have any concerns that sort of local politics and and political egos would uh, delay any of the needed urgent transit work? Unfortunately, well, there is not I, a lot I, of time I do believe left in for conflict. a response. I, I do believe in conflict, but I also believe that uh, no, I don't think it would hamper. Uh, okay, I'm out I, of time. I, I I'd think love part of arriving at good more. decisions is is hearing different perspectives, and uh, okay, I Fred, think we'll the just, people who would we'll, end up being appointed to the board, who would be actually, if if the Fred, mayor's Fred, represent I'm sorry, two elected Councilor, officials, Councilor Boyle's out of time, so I do apologize for cutting you off there. Um, but you do have questions from Councilor Fry, and perhaps um, we'll. Hear more of an answer there. Go ahead, Councillor Fry. Dr. Bass, thank you. Thank you for your service to the city, and uh, and great to have you here. Uh, and I was aware that you were previously on the TransLink board, and so I'm curious: were, did you get any specialized transit management training when you were on the board? No. And are you aware if the board does now? Um, not that I know of. I don't know. Right. So I, I mean, it was an introduction. They were very generous, so somewhat like what happens when you come to City Council. But not actually as much. So, so did you, as as a as a board member, did you find the learning curve to be pretty steep? I appreciate you it's came with pretty a preventative. Steep. Yes. Yeah, okay. I mean, yeah. I appreciate you came with a medical background that probably touched on some of the importance of transit for preventative medicine type approaches and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, okay. So I want to also touch then on sort of the elephant in the room, and that's that when you were on TransLink board, uh, you were one of the members who voted against the Canada line, which now obviously we see as. I, I, I was the first person, and, and the first time I came before City Council, I was the only person to oppose it. Now, in, in retrospect, because I think, you know, whereas Canada line is not perfect, it has certainly been a success on many levels, and I think has increased yeah. transit ridership yeah. and, and improved the, yeah. the accessibility of, of yeah. Well, I want to be really clear. First of all, I came here on the Canada Line this morning. I love it, okay? However, when you're 500 to 600 buses behind on the transit plan, 500 to 600 buses behind, you don't build a rapid transit line, even if there's money available because there happens to be an Olympic in town. There's a fundamental problem with funding uh, transit and, and it's either feast or famine, and it needs to become more steady and organized, like we fund the police, the fire departments, and other things. Okay, do you, do you, do you, I mean, but I guess where I'm going with this is the inherent risk uh, to the potential for politicizing important decisions like that. Do you see a mechanism to? It, you know, um, that it, it calling that politicized. Calling my vote politicized, I, as a, as a, as a um, I believe that there are right answers. Now, politics is more complicated than always voting for the right answers. But my vote was not political. I, I, it, it was it, the other vote was politicized. Yeah. So um, I think I, I uh, would there be more? It, it, one of the things that um, happens with boards of all kinds um, is that they tend to be yes people. 
And uh, I say that from having done some reading in what makes for a good board in the last few days, uh, empirical studies of that. And I think it was McKinsey, the consultants, in, in terms of advising corporate boards, they said, you don't want to be yes people, and yet 40% of boards in their survey uh, said that they were um, kind of yes I know I'm out of time, but that is a great point to end on. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. You do have uh, questions, more questions. Uh, Councillor Swanson. Yes, hi, Fred. Nice to see you. Um, I was just, hi, Jane. I was just <laughs> thinking here, uh, what would you think of some sort of, if we could get some sort of rule that in order to be on the TransLink, to, in order to make decisions about transit, transit, you had to not own a car. Do you think that would help at all? Um, I think that would be discriminatory. So, uh, <laughs> though I would, I would not, I would not be for that. Uh, but uh, I no, I, I don't think that would work. I, th I think the uh, I think it shows how far. Um, I you know I really think that most of the people on the board uh, haven't yet learned that at least in the city. Uh, and uh, in other cities, the bicycle is faster than a car. But uh, but I, I know I wouldn't be for that. I, okay, thanks. And thanks for coming. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Swanson. Those are all your questions, Fred. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thanks so much, though. Thank you. So that brings us to... Um, the work that we had to complete before our dinner or our lunch break and it's 1215 so we will reconvene in camera at 115 <coughs> and uh, have a good lunch council
test, test. Elise, can you hear me? Test, test, test. Elise, can you hear me? I can hear you. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, welcome. welcome back, Council. We are um, reconvening after our lunch and in-camera uh, sessions from um, this morning session, and I just want to refresh where we are at. So we are, um, we are uh, working through Agenda Item uh, four, sorry, local elected representation on the transit board. And we have heard from two speakers and we have more speakers uh, who are currently on the line. So we're going to start with speaker one, um, John Irwin, commissioner of park board, who has joined via the phone. John, are you there? Your, your audio is cutting out a bit sometimes, so I'm not sure. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you. We'll let our IT team know. Uh, John, we can hear you. You're a little faint, so... Shall I go can... ahead? 
You can go ahead, just to have you speak directly into the microphone and perhaps speak up, just so we can hear you clearly. Okay, I'll, I'll do that, and thanks, uh, uh, Committee uh, uh, Chair Bly, for having me to speak today. I'm speaking as a citizen. I'm not speaking for the Park Board, just to get that clear. I'm speak speaking in favour of the motion, and, and I guess for me what it boils down to is I was in um, graduate school, took many courses uh, back in the 90s, at the time that TransLink was created um, in, um, you know, 1998-99. And, you know, so it was a big topic of discussion for us, you know, in terms of regional uh, governance. And, and I remember that a big uh, item was would the TransLink board be elected or be made up of elected representatives? And I think that was a big carrot for a lot of us was that, uh, it would be there would be a good chunk of elected representatives on the board, and then that that would represent um, the uh, you know the uh, citizens of, of you know all parts of the region, right? So so we view that as something that made it a lot more acceptable. Um, I do remember when I came to town that you know I was kind of impressed that you know BC Transit when it ran this ran the system had won an award in I think 1995 1996. Just a wee tiny bit about my background. I don't want to take up too much of your time. I know you've got a long meeting ahead of you, long day. Um, you know, I was on the Edmonton Transit System Advisory Board, and uh, so that, was the, that was kind of the way people to talk to the transit system. Quite a different structure in the sense that the city of Edmonton, you know, is the sole operator and owner of that system. So it's it's quite different from our uh, system with a regional. Um, board governing the uh, the transit system, and you know I just want to really highlight that in order to to move forward and get as many people as possible onto uh, transit and also other active modes of transportation, um, you know we're going to really have to you know uh, up the service as much as we can and, and make it uh, as efficient as possible and maybe have some dedicated. Uh, bus lanes, uh, you know, like they do in the Ottawa system, um, and yeah. So, you know, I also have worked as um, an instructor in, in geography of transportation and a researcher in, in the field as well. So, and that's not to say, you know, that I know everything about these things, but I, I would just urge you to support the motion, um, you know, in, in order to try to get the the board uh, back to being local elected officials. Just wanted to say something about the expertise because I would say that you know even though you know uh, I could claim a bit of it, like I wouldn't say a lot of it or all of it, that I think it's really important that elected officials learn about really important systems, um, you know, as elected officials. So I, I think that's another way to look at it is kind of to turn it around and say actually learn a lot more about the system, and then if you're trying to improve it to meet to meet the big move around. Uh, transit and active transportation, you can really get there. I uh, wanted to point out one other aspect of this is that for the most part I try to ride everywhere because I'm a, you know, a cyclist and a transit user, but I found uh, you know, in some, some of my tr work trips uh, you know, that using uh, transit as a booster, you know, getting on the, on the buses with the bike racks and getting on the SkyTrain has really extended my reach when I need it, so there's quite an intermodal aspect to it as well. But uh, yeah, anyway, that's that's my perspective. I uh, strongly support this. Um, you know, I think when it was removed, uh, you know, the political, uh, you know, majority was m removed in 2008. I think that was a, a bad thing that happened. And uh, yes, and I'll, I'll let you go. Also, support the subsequent motion dealing with Quebec, but I'm kind of going out of my lane there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, John, you do have questions from Councillor Boyle. Hi, uh, John, I'll be really brief. I'm just wondering, you mentioned the example of um, advisory councils or committees, uh, and I wonder um, if that might be an approach that would actual, that could actually ensure more voice for transit riders than would necessarily be the case with just more uh, locally elected reps. Yeah, I mean that that might not be an a bad idea, but I just I just feel that you know when the decision making authority for 
a service that's so vital to uh, a lot of the public, you know, those of us who are transit uh, dependent, that it, you know, I think both of those things could happen, actually, that an elected, you know, an elected board could move to have, uh, you know, to empower a, a committee similar to the one that I sat on in Edmonton, you know, so I don't think the two preclude each other. You know, I just feel that, you know, decisions might get made, um, you know, more, more in our interest. You know, one example would be we approached, um, you know, the minister responsible uh, for TransLink uh, about trying to get all electric buses uh, moving forward very quickly, um, and, and it seemed to get, um, you know, stalled. So, so if we could approach, you know, mayors and councillors on TransLink with similar ideas, it might get over the line and get us uh, moving quicker on the climate crisis, you know, seemingly turning into climate chaos. Uh, but thanks for your question. Councillor Boyle. Okay, thanks for your time. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Boyle, you have additional questions, John, from Councillor Swanson. Go ahead, Councillor. Yeah, thanks for coming, John. I wonder if you could um, hold forth for a minute or two on why you, you, you think that an elected board would be more responsive to transit users and to climate issues than what we have now. Yeah, I just think, you know, I, I know that, you know, it's not necessarily, you know, 100% perfect solution, you know, but I do really admire all the work that all you folks do and that we try to do on the park board. And I just think we, we're much more sensitive to, you know, what people want or we can engage in, with the public more than a remote board of, you know, mostly hired uh, executives could, right? And and so so I think that, well, I know it's maybe not going to be perfect. I think it would be uh, better. A and yeah, well, I have a second. I just wanted to give a shout out to former uh, councillor, um, uh, oh no, Fred Bass, who I've really long admired, and and it was great to hear him out speaking on the issue. Okay. okay thanks. Thank you Thank very you. much. Uh, John, those are all your questions. We appreciate you coming to uh, or calling Thank in to speak to council. Everybody. All right, take care. Bye-bye. Next, we have Speaker 2, Mark White. Uh, Mark White is the co-chair for Seniors Advisory Committee. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Mark. Thank you. Hello. You, please go ahead. You have five minutes. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Councillors, for the opportunity to speak. As a resident in Vancouver, I'm grateful to live and volunteer on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Salish Nations. I'm speaking on behalf of the Seniors Advisory Committee. The City of Vancouver is striving to create complete communities as part of its Climate Action Plan, where businesses and people can live, learn, work, play, and age in community. Success is contingent on having a local transit system that's cognizant of the needs of people of all ages, including older adults and elders, and people with disabilities and families with small children. Bus stops need to be accessible and placed at key destinations of daily living, including pharmacies, food banks, grocery stores, medical services, schools, parks, community centers, libraries, neighborhood houses, and faith organizations. They need to have supportive amenities, such as shelters and benches, <clears throat> uh, placed at distances that are carefully planned so those with mobility impairments can continue to access transit in order to maintain independent outdoor mobility and age well in community. This has not been the case with TransLink's current overemphasis on satisfying the needs of regional customers and rapidly reducing the number of local bus stops mostly ignoring the needs of seniors and people with disabilities and the real benefits of having a robust local transportation system. As mentioned uh, by SAC, uh, older adults are, represent the fastest growing demographic in Vancouver, and we'll soon have data to show that with the new census. Uh, public transit is critical to older adults as the health and physical function declines. Maintaining out-of-home activities can have a protective effect on one's health and lower the risk of transfers to long-term care. Older adults who use public transport 
uh, have reported an increase in walking three or more times per week, and older adults who walk and use public transit have higher co cognitive uh, independence. International research has found that municipalities that have offered older adults free bus passes on off-peak uh, hours have substantial increase in transit use. And as well, ICBC driving records show that licensed drivers across BC drop substantially after age 65 and even more after 75. In Metro Vancouver, uh, that this equ uh, equates um, to over 400,000 uh, residents over the age of 75, approximately, who currently need an active transportation and transit strategy dedicated to their needs. Uh, SAC strongly supports this motion as there's a need for a change in governance structure. And we believe the city's climate plan and renewed commitment to become an age-friendly city requires that the city of Vancouver and other municipalities to have greater representation on TransLink's board. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. You do have questions from Councillor Swanson. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks for uh, coming in, Mark. I just wondered if you could uh, answer that same question I asked before. Why would you think that the structure that's proposed by the motion would be more responsive to the needs, in your case, of seniors and the climate than the current structure? Well, I think uh, elected officials have uh, some accountability to populations that elect them, and appointees have accountability only to their political masters. Now, there are various models of greater representativeness on transit boards, as, as the last speaker spoke of, uh, from the Parks Board, um, as well as there's a separation of functions. Uh, but the purpose of the motion is really to improve democratic representation which actually was the election promise by the NDP, which criticized the current structure. Um, simply a review of the governance structure is needed and greater consideration needed to get uh, to uh, better ensure that decisions are made that benefit the public, including older adults and elders. The motion itself doesn't quite define the structure, just that there's a need to improve representation of municipalities that it serves. I think the alternative question is, is the current situation with not having representation on TransLink board problematic, given that currently over 50% of the ridership of TransLink is moving people around and in and out of the city? Okay, thanks so much, Mark. And that's all your questions, Mark. Thank you for calling in today. Thank you so much. Next, we have uh, in person, speaker number one from the public, uh, speaker list, Nathan Davidovich. You're ready Thank to you. Uh, anytime, Nathan, go ahead. Uh, you have a whole bunch of IT problems and uh, they don't seem to uh, go away. It was all this morning, I was just downstairs at the big TV room on a ground floor. You can hardly hear John Elvin at all. Uh, so there is, there is all kinds of, that's why I came down here because I couldn't hear much on my uh, thing, you know, and this is not the first time. Okay, how Nathan. How many IT Nathan? problems you've had for the last two years? So I do absolutely you know, take your point. How many IT problem has the BC legislator had? How many? Nathan, uh, in order almost for, nothing. For, in order for us to you know? hear from you today on the motion, I want yeah. you to start because your time. Yeah. Is, your no, time thank is you. Boring. Yeah, I just I'm just uh, really frustrated about the IT and you know, uh, uh, okay. There there have been six different organizations in the past sixty years in Greater Vancouver for for transit governance. Toronto had one since 1921, Edmonton had one since 1908. And that's part of the problem. All, I mean, all the councillors in those major cities, they have better understanding of transit as it is a department at City Hall. It takes lots of time to understand a transit system and Vancouver councillors were on that path from 1999 to 2007 
when three councillors served on the board of directors of TransLink. Now the architect of changing TransLink in 2007 is the new leader of the opposition party. So it's a good time to point out how bad the present governance is. The 2008 governance was based on the BC Ferry governance. BC Ferry is completely different than transit and it, it, uh, it has no relation. The, the Mayor Council on Regional Transportation has been advocating for changes in governance for a number of years, but the BC government has ignored the request. One way to bring the issue again is for all the major cities in Metro Vancouver to support this motion, and maybe then the BC government will wake up and amend the legislation. Taxation without representation. We all pay taxes to TransLink, but we do not have direct control how the money is being spent. There is no detailed budget available similar to the city budget. Money is being wasted every day. Transit mode split is way low in 2022, and unless we copy from other system, we will not recover till 2025-26. Uh, you know, uh, the, the senior staff in Vancouver are avoiding taking responsibility. It is the city of Vancouver that pays 50% of the cost of the trolley poles. The city of Vancouver regulate the parking on bus routes and have final say on bus routes and bus stops. But the city staff don't want to report to you about it. There is citizen representation in other transit commissions for example, Ottawa, in Victoria, even the Victoria Regional Transit Commission, they have a representation of the post-secondary students on their, on, their, uh, on their board. So there's very other uh, models that uh, do work in other cities and, uh, and we have to, to advocate for a proper representation here in Metro Vancouver. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nathan. You have questions? Councillor Hardwick, please go ahead. Hi, Nathan. Um, the Independent Transit Commissioner Office, you mentioned that. Can you tell us a little bit about that? It, it, does that impact any of our future governance thinking, and do you know why it was terminated? Well, uh, TransLink staff come up with a whole bunch of different reports, and you know, the board and the mayor council just rubber stamped them basically because the transit commissioner office, office that was, uh, 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 was closed in 2014, he used to provide independent advice of what's happening in the transit and he took surveys of other cities and, you know, he did all kinds of work, but we don't have any of that. Uh, information anymore because the office doesn't exist. Well, why? Well, why? So uh, when I hear independence I, oversight, I find that in, interesting for obvious reasons. Why was it terminated? Do you recall? I mean, I don't well, remember personally. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's part of changes that uh, the government of the day thought it might uh, please the mayor's council if there is no oversight above them that, uh, I, I, you know, but I mean, there is, there is many changes that have been made over the years that are not uh, appropriate. And uh, I mean, uh, well, they, they, they took away the hospital planning, for example, from Metro Vancouver. And one reason they took it away is to say, oh, well, you have transportation planning now but they don't do any transportation planning. So let's just, so uh, what I'm getting from this though is that there's been a, a big loss of institutional memory. I guess I'm not knowing this and, and I know there's been significant turnover at TransLink. Uh, well, there's significant trans uh, turnover when we get to elections as well. So specifically, why um, do you think that it makes sense to have electeds there rather than appointeds? Well, uh, this is what we have at Metro Vancouver. Metro Vancouver was in charge of transit. 
from 1979 to 1983 that it was taken away from them by the government. Uh, the Naimo Regional District is still in charge of their transit system since 1969. So it's just a matter of putting it back into Metro Vancouver. That's where it is uh, because that's our regional government. And transit is a regional service, the same way as water and sewer and so forth. I'm running out of time because I think yeah. we only get three minutes. Is that accurate? Okay. But I am interested in the difference between elected versus appointed. Um, so maybe we can pick that up later. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Councillor Hardwick. Uh, Councillor Swanson. Yeah, um, I just wanted to, I'll follow up on that question from Councillor Hardwick, um, Nathan. Um, why do you think that the structure that's proposed in this motion would be more accountable than what we have now? Well, uh, we know it was more accountable uh, when Vancouver had three councillors on, 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 on Transling Board of Directors for many years. And, and prior to that, it was also more accountable when Metro Vancouver uh, was in charge. Uh, so, uh, and, and that's the way it is in, in, in all of BC, all the, the, the regional governments and, uh, and cities are, are in charge and they're all elected. And why should uh, Metro Vancouver be different than every other uh, area in, in BC? It, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever, but uh, you know, we, we can point out to so many things over the years that TransLink have done wrong and bad. And because there is no oversight, that's why we are number four in Canada uh, when we used to be number one on per capita. And that's why we are behind uh, 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 in electrification in Canada. We are the last big city to, to, to really tackle electrification. And uh, so all these things are because we don't have elected officials on the TransLink board to push the region view and the individual cities view on climate change and uh, and better transit okay thanks nathan thanks very much nathan those are all your questions and i just take your point on the it thank you for the feedback we'll make sure we get that our staff are definitely hearing that feedback um so we do have speaker number two on the line and that is joe um, Kunzler. Hello, can you hear me? Hi there, yes. Hello. We can hear you. You Thank have you. five Joe minutes, please go ahead. Thank you, Vancouver City Council and Mayor Stewart. Joe Kunzler here, one of TransLink's friends from the U.S. First, I want to take a moment and thank you for doing Pink Shirt Day. I was a victim of intensive bullying in the public schools, so deeply appreciate the gesture this morning. But it isn't why I'm here. Rather, I sent your council an open letter discussing what I perceive the stakes are, having interacted with many transit boards from the World Famous Mayor's Council to the Bay Area Rapid Transit Board to Sound Transit to Skagit Transit and others. But um, first, I must say I appreciate Councillor Boyle asking pointed questions of the first speaker supporting this wild proposed solution to perceived problems. I agree with that first speaker that no governance model is perfect. But when TransLink is so successful, having hosted Railvolution and won APTA Transit of the Year in 2019 and leading in the recovery from COVID-19, why change now? No, seriously, when you got Sarah Rosh, Jada Stevens, and yes, Minister Bowen Ma, why change now? Oh, because some don't like bus stop spacing. That's beyond sanity to make a, a huge change over local issues that could be resolved by requesting Sarah Ross come to your council, make the case, and hear from her. I know, Sarah, if you keep the discussion focused on the issues and not her, all good. So why change governance now? As I explained in my letter, I have had some experiences less than pleasant with more elected officials in the transit governance kitchen. In my sketch, we have moderately disruptive board members who are or were mayors on the board who sometimes wanted to defund, again, defund 
the basics of transit, so I have to stand on guard for fee to push back against her ignorance. I do not think you want this. Versus the collaborative nature of the world-famous Mayor's Council, tempered by a board of experts. Now, you may want in a directly elected board. Sure, I'm worried about keeping big money out so transit advocates can get on the board. The problem is if transit advocates, and I, I am one, and I know many, we will trade experience for enthusiasm and we'll go after the shiny new object or chase after Bowen Ma to be CEO or some other superstar to be CEO. I also worry about corporate capture getting worse and leaving behind those who need transit the most. Also, there needs to be some insulation from electoral politics, as if you don't like the mobility pricing being vetoed by the Premier and Minister Ma and, yes, Minister Fleming. You really aren't going to like what an elected TransLink board could choose to do. Granted, yes, the, the Bay Area Rapid Transit or BART board in the Bay Area is doing okay, but that's because big money's not involved, and that's because progressives have leaned in to hold most of the seats, and they've hired a great staff. As far as getting transit supporter input, I appreciate greatly the discussion that just happened about getting more riders advisory councils like what Skagit Transit has. And I, w I need to stress this. I do not speak for Skagit Transit. I do not speak for TransLink, et cetera, et cetera. These are all my personal views. But personally, I think it's important to directly connect riders to a transit governance. I used to serve on the Skagit Transit Community, Community Advisory Committee with a mixed bag of success. We were able to slay Skagit Transit to couple a paratransit fare to a summer youth pass in 2019, for instance, and I can expound upon this upon request how we pulled that off. But that was something I personally quarterbacked. Um, and that was something that was an idea that came from the writers, not the planners. However, if you're not happy with the current Translate governance, if I can get a word in edgewise, Translate needs one minister responsible. I would if I was a counselor, I would ask for a Deputy Premier Bowen Ma, Minister Responsible for Translink. I totally understand if the council says no to this. In conclusion, I ask again, why change now? To quote Minister Bowen Ma, a government serves people, and when a government delivers services, they deliver them to real people, people who live, who laugh, who cry, who suffer, who yell out in pain, who loved and are loved, end quote. I ask that as you look at this motion, you frame your decisions in that space. The current TransLink governance structure centers real people and has been internationally validated as such between an APTA 2019 award plus hosting Revolution, plus having many American and Canadian fans as the world's best transit, and therefore I urge great caution and deep deliberation before challenging, changing that structure, please. I await your questions. Thank you for the time, and go TransLink. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Joe. There are no questions for you, but we appreciate uh, hearing from you today. Uh, you're quite welcome. I'm disappointed there were no questions. I I feel your pain. That is where we're at. So uh, we're going to move on to our final speaker, um, Speaker for Mark Beeching. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm, I'm the president of AU, Amalgamated Transit Workers Union, 1724, the union that represents the workers who are out there every day right now, driving your mothers, your fathers, your sisters, and your brothers. <coughs> um, they, uh, and also the office staff and maintenance. Um, transit is connected to the health of the community and that connection has been somewhat severed when the mayors had less decision-making power on the TransLink board. Um, and this has been an ongoing uh, issue where there's a disconnect between the disabled community and with the decision-makers. Um, when a, a municipal um, a person is elected from in a municipal government is directly connected and accessible to disabled people and seniors. 
um, they, they have an uh, people have an opportunity to reach them and have their voices. In 2004, uh, there was a contract, uh, Handy Daughters contracted out, and a company was going to take over and fire every worker and have a job fair, and the entire system was going to be sent into turmoil. I had the opportunity to speak to Marlene um, in and uh, she took the time to speak to me where I wouldn't have had that opportunity elsewhere and she was the deciding vote that protected her service from decimation. And yes, having workers lose their jobs that have been dedicated, have been doing this for 40 years. across the lower mainland. The concern we have is that we seem to be going towards having advisory committees. And I support that. The problem is, is that advisory committees don't have the final say. And therein lies the rub. We need to have people that are elected and accountable on the ground floor who are vested in their communities to have a say as to the decisions that are making made in TransLink. I see often TransLink will have focus groups that are really not um, places of input, but they're structured. When I sit down with Marlene and talk to her about the issues, she heard me and she understood. Whereas a focus group is orchestrated by people that have no connection to their community. So I would say that I uh, want to thank the movers of this motion. I hope that you will consider that um, the ele municipal electors are a part of an accessible transit system and that we need that connection. We can't have a continued disconnect between the people that are on the ground doing the work with their constituents and the constituents have a voice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. There are no questions, but we appreciate hearing from you today. Thank you. So that does bring us to the end of the speaker's list. So we'll just move over back over to the main queue. And this motion has been um, moved and seconded, of course. So now we will move to debate. Professor Hardwick. Well, I'm going to speak in support of this motion. I believe that having uh, an open and democratic process is the success of our public institutions, even ones that are hybrid. Um, I'm much more comfortable seeing elected representatives sitting on the TransLink board than I am seeing appointed, uh, which are essentially, in many cases, political appointments. Uh, put on the board. So uh, to Councillor Fry and Councillor Swanson, you have my support. That's it. Thank you very much, Councillor Hardwick. Councillor Swanson. Yeah, um, I think we have a problem with transit, TransLink the way it is. Um, we're facing a climate disaster and we have to get people out of cars. And the best way to do this is to have a really good transit system that's easy and convenient to use. But lately, TransLink has been cutting out bus stops, reducing the frequency of services, raising fares, and finding people who have no money. These are all things that reduce ridership. We've passed motions on all those things, but nothing happens because we don't control transit. TransLink does, and TransLink is appointed and not accountable to people who elect them. So this motion, as you know now, came from the city's transportation committee, endorsed by the seniors committee. It's calling for more democratic representation on Trans TransLink. And the hope is that if the folks on the board are elected, if they're elected reps, maybe we can get a better system. I'm persuaded by the speakers like Mark Beeching, 
that having elected folks responsible for transit will be more accountable than in our current system. We definitely need a connection between the transit users and the decision makers. And I think this motion, if, if the province does what we're asking, would be a good first step in that direction. That's it for me. Thank you, Councillor Swanson. Councillor Boyle. Thanks. Um, I, I, I want to just start by saying I have uh, grappled with this a lot. I have spent a lot of time uh, talking this issue through with folks over the last week um, to better understand it. Um, I, I, I get that it's just the mayor writing a letter. Um, and I think these are important conversations and so have been diving pretty deep into this one. Um, I love transit. I ride transit. Uh, I want a strong, robust public transportation system. Um, I absolutely hear the challenges we've been hearing from speakers around bus stop balancing, um, around a confusing governance structures that currently exist, around confusion about uh, how public input is uh engaged and encouraged um and in particular about a lack of transit rider voices uh representation of people who ride transit and transit advocates in the system um all of those i absolutely agree are issues um that we need to keep working on uh, and the place i keep getting stuck as uh as you heard my questions is just not being convinced that the proposed solution is going to fix uh, any of those challenges. Um, and so I have some benefit in seeing some of how the system works. Uh, I was a uh, sub for the mayor at the mayor's council meeting this morning. Um, I uh, get to do that every now and then. Um, and so see the inside of it. I see that table of elected leaders. Uh, being pretty deeply involved um, in policy decisions, visioning and direction around transit. Um, and we have had pretty good uh, recovery, uh, ridership recovery from COVID. Their ridership of TransLink has grown really strongly over a decade. Um, TransLink's recently released draft climate plan is incredibly ambitious. Uh, I do, uh, I'm weighing this because I see a lot of um, very good work happening there. And, and again, I recognize the governance structure is currently uh, somewhat confusing. Um, and I see the good work that's coming out of it. Not perfect, absolutely. Lots of room for improvement, but good work. Um, so that's what I keep wrestling with. Uh, I absolutely agree we need more transit users and advocates uh, at the decision making table. Um, I'm not sure that more elected voices will get us there. We uh, know that um, many elected leaders aren't transit users. Um, many or probably all of our elected councils in the region are behind on uh, climate targets. We in Vancouver are failing to meet our own climate plans. Um, we are not doing enough ourselves on accessibility. So more elected I appreciate the and absolutely agree with the the need for more accountability in that way. And yet we are failing on those fronts too. And so I continue to grapple with whether that really is a solution for the clear problem that we agree on in front of us. And I worry about the risk of local fights derailing urgently needed action, local and regional action on climate. So um, I I have really wrestled with this one. Um, because I agree absolutely with the challenges named um, and just don't see that the uh, solution gets us there. Um, and we'll just close by saying either way, those are all issues I, I have been advocating on and I will continue to advocate on in the many ways I think uh, are needed to address them. Thank you, Councillor Boyle. Uh Councillor Fry. Yeah, I'll try and keep this pretty brief. Um, obviously, this you know this this is a direction that's come not just from the transportation advisory committee, but also has come from 
uh, the mayor's council itself on numerous occasions, and as recently as the 2020 uh, general provincial election. Uh, I think that there's there's been this notion that suggests that the current board is, a, is a, a, an expert board. I'm not necessarily convinced that that is the case. There's some very capable people on the current board, but I don't think that they're necessarily experts. And with that said, um, I don't think that as elected, we're expected to be experts. That's why we rely on staff and we have uh, very proficient and staff resources to provide that expertise. Uh, as electeds, our role is, is accountability and representation of the public. And because TransLink is uh, a taxing authority uh, and they collect money from our tax bills, um, there is, I think, a direct line for accountability with the public that, that, that pay for that. And furthermore, recognizing that there are a lot of people who rely on transit. Uh, I take transit all the time, and um, I see certainly where there are areas that could be improved um, that maybe don't get hurt by this current board, and maybe could use a little bit of uh, input from, from the public by way of their elected representation. So. Um, thanks for giving me this time to speak to the motion, and I'll be voting in favor of this motion, obviously, as I submit it. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Fry. Councillor Kirby Young. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I think Councillor Boyle articulated a lot of um, similar thoughts to what I had and great points, and I won't necessarily reiterate those, but try to add a few additional ones. And I think that is um, the importance. I think we'll start with looking at the overall governance structure holistically and it was quite clear to me um, in reading the motion itself uh, in terms of the clause pertaining specifically only to the TransLink board um, in the comments from the mover of the motion when it was introduced and then also from the speakers from our advisory committee um, and specifically transportation that the TransLink board had been considered in isolation and not with respect to the other governance ecosystem and structure, including the Mayor's Regional Council on Transportation, um, or the linkage into Metro Vancouver. And I think that that's a challenge um, because they are interconnected and the governance system is complex. Um, and so we, that's kind of the job is for Council to sort of differentiate between a number of different issues. I really appreciate the strong advocacy from the Transportation Committee and the Seniors Committee. Those are important considerations with respect to bus balancing, penetration in terms of routes, availability of stops, things of that nature. And so the question I would ask is, are we fully utilizing the channels and the avenues that we have in order to bring those concerns forward and advocate vociferously? And we do obviously have the mayor sitting and representative on that and other councillors that participate from time to time to bring those concerns forward. I took the opportunity to speak with a number of um, past and current councillors, both past Vancouver councillors, as well as current municipal councillors from other regions, because I wanted to seek input and a perspective and a point of view. And what I heard from several people that I reached out to, and I would say of differing political stripes on the issue, was a common perspective that this was not going to a, a step forward in terms of trying to achieve the goal. I think the goal is laudable, but I don't think that the mechanism is the way to get there. And we had discussions around specific situations, such as the Canada Line, which is probably one of the th transit options that I use the most frequently. Um, it helped uh, in terms of selecting where I live in terms of access, and it provides a very different type of service to things like bus routes. And so I bring that example up because that was sort of apparently back in the day, a reputed point of um, difference of opinions amongst the electeds of the day that sat on a previous iteration and the structure of the board and is reputed to have resulted in some delay in building that. We know when you have mega transit infrastructure like that, that the more you delay, the cost could increase, but eventually they got to the same place. We could have got there more quickly. Um, and I think that's really important because you do want a board that doesn't feel, the flip side of it is that you could say, okay, well, your current electeds are more um, sensitive to public opinion, and that's true, but they're also sometimes sensitive to that public opinion in the moment, within that short four-year cycle. And when you're talking about transit investment um, and planning and advocacy for that, you are trying to plan for decades and generations, right? And so one of the issues that we have as a very young city 
is that we don't have that significant transit infrastructure that has been built out and existed for centuries, like in the UK, France, Hong Kong, right? A number of other cities. Um, and sometimes it's easier for them to do things like um, climate friendly communities and denser communities and walkable cities because they have the infrastructure and we don't. Um, we're also much sort of bigger geographically. So, and we do have to think about how people move across the region as well, but balance that with local needs. So I really appreciate where the folks are coming from. I think the council can take that feedback really seriously and look for ways to advocate on that. But I'm not convinced that there's been enough um, robustness in this motion to look at sort of the overall transit system and ecosystem. I also think too to say it's there isn't elected influence on that board wouldn't be correct because there's a couple of mayors, half of the appointees um, are put forward by mayors um, and that, that's really not different um, than the electeds of the day. Um, they all come with a political connotation, if you will. So um, I'm inclined to um, sort of align with some of the concerns that were shared by my fellow Councillor Boyle and not support the motion. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Kirby Young. And seeing no other councillors on the queue, we're going to move to a vote. Checking on, I believe Councillor Di Genova and Councillor Dominato are both absent from the meeting at this point. So that motion does pass with three in opposition Councillor Boyle, Councillor Kirby Young, and myself, Councillor Bly. Thank you very much, Council. So now we will be moving to um, item six, or sorry, item five on our agenda, which is supporting the legal challenge against discrimination implied in Quebec's Bill 21, which was moved and introduced by Councillor Swanson and seconded by Councillor Boyle. Uh, and we do have speakers on this motion as it was referred from the council meeting yesterday. And we're gonna go ahead and um, call on those speakers at this time. So the first speaker on the queue is Guntas Kaur. Yes, hello. Hi there, we can hear you. You have five what? minutes, please go ahead. Thank you. Hello, my name is Guntas Kaur. I am the vice president for BC with the World Sick Organization of Canada. We are in favor of the motion and I am not a resident of Vancouver. The World Sick Organization is a not-for-profit organization with a mandate to promote and protect the interests of Canadian Sikhs, as well as to promote and advocate for the protection of human rights for all, indiv my pardon, for all individuals, irrespective of race, religion, gender, ethnicity, and social and economic status. We're one of the organizations on the ground in Quebec and are the main appellant in the case before the Quebec Court of Appeal against Quebec's Bill 21 or secularism law. Although this issue may look as though it's far removed from Vancouver, it's vital that municipalities become involved in the fight against Bill 21. We recognize and are grateful that this council chose to raise its voice in 2019 and condemn Bill 21 for what it was, a violation of fundamental freedoms. This motion before you represents the next step in that condemnation, taking action against discrimination, standing in allyship with your neighbors of all faiths. In the times we live in, money is one of those tangible actions that speaks volumes. The act of contributing funds to a cause raises awareness. But in this instance, I will also say it raises spirits. WSO is a community-run organization. Our fights have always been something we took on ourselves with pride in the hope and knowledge that we will make life better for others. However, every now and then, everyone needs to feel that their battles are everyone's battles that we have allies, especially allies at home, where we live, work, and play. Standing against Bill 21, we're facing the endless resources of a provincial government, and your decision today can help us all level that playing field. It's been said, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. 
After World War II, the global community promised to speak out against discrimination and religious persecution. However, we are seeing the rise of so much ugliness today, and not just in one country, but around the world, even here in Canada. We're not called on to be vigilant only when discrimination appears at our doorstep, but rather whenever and wherever it may be that touches our lives and that challenges our principles as a society. I know so many of us are looking for a way to not just raise our voice, but to demonstrate tangibly that we mean what we say, that we're willing to act. Sometimes that also means challenging the idea that a problem has to be here at home to act. Distance is not and will not be an adequate barrier nor a defense to discrimination. How do we as a society continue to tell our children that they can be anything they want to be and still be true to their identity and their roots? That Canada is, a rich, is richer for its diversity if we're so okay with witnessing a, t a Canadian teacher not teaching because she wears a dasad, the sick turban, or a hijab. That depending on where someone lives, it's okay to make someone choose between their work and their identity. Is this the Canada we want our kids to see and to inherit? I am confident that the decision Vancouver makes today will be in the spirit of unity and allyship. That when we look back on this day, history will show a city that chose to act. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much. Uh, you do have questions, so I'll advance Councillor Carr. Please go ahead. Yes, um, thanks very much. And thanks for speaking with me the other day. I really appreciated our conversation a lot. Um, I'm wondering if, um, if you can um, provide a response to the idea that uh, that we as council and even we as a city um, really support and actually encourage um, individuals sort of more broadly within society to really get behind um, the fight against this B uh, bill 21. In other words, to support the legal challenge that's going on right now. I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you the other day as well, and I really enjoyed our conversation. And as to this question, I do appreciate the question, and I believe that as I spoke in my, my comments that, you know, we as a community have taken on these legal challenges in the past on our own. But it's, it's sometimes there is, an, there is a need to feel, and it's always welcome to feel that we are part of Canadian society, Canadian fabric, and that our challenges as people of perhaps more visible faith practice are still felt and considered to be a part of greater Canadian society and fabric. And so we welcome the support. Um, and I would, I would certainly second your comments that, um, support your comments that we make a wider call out to, to our community um, and, and, and seek that support uh, for, for such a challenge that we're facing. Yeah. Well, th thank you, and thank you for all your incredibly good work for making our um, our society, our country, uh, so so much more better a place. Thank you, and thank you for your work. We do have more questions, Councillor Swanson? Yeah, thanks so much for getting involved in this, for talking to me, and for your presentation that you just made, which I thought was really eloquent. Um, Thank you. So one of the problems with the city giving money to this cause is that the city's budget is very tight. And I'm afraid that some of the councillors, another problem would be that some people would say that we're uh, kind of out of our jurisdiction, that this isn't a municipal issue. So I'm wondering how you would respond on those two fronts, that we don't have enough money uh, even though we do have a reserve fund with, with 40 odd million dollars in it um, and that we're getting out of our municipal responsibilities by doing something like this. How would you respond? I would respond by saying, you know, as to my, my conversation with many councillors this past couple of weeks, that we, you know, in these organizations certainly recognize the challenges that municipalities are facing financially to provide services and to for their for their citizens and residents that live in those those jurisdictions and those areas. However, it's unfortunate that challenges such as Bill 21 don't come at convenient times, whether financially, economically, fiscally, whatever it might be. 
they don't come at times that are convenient for society as, as a whole, and they don't create convenience either. Um, and that we, as as a community, sometimes have to look beyond our our you know geographic borders, as I've said in my statement, and and consider what this says about us as you know uh, for all of you as residents of Vancouver but also as us as greater as citizens and residents of the of Metro Vancouver of British Columbia and as Canadians as a whole that we in our own backyard will not challenge uh, or will not uh, are are apprehensive of of putting actions behind uh, a challenge such as this uh, something that is uh, I would from my conversations with many councillors these past couple of weeks, say that is abhorrent to most of us and would be to most to members of our societies that we live in. So um, while I can understand the difficulty behind it, I do think that there are certain times when challenges like this ask us to really dig deep and look at the principle behind what we're fighting and we're supporting and consider that to speak, you know, um, and require us to, to rise to the challenge. Okay, thank you so much, dear. You're very welcome. Thank you. And thank you very much. Uh, those are your questions, but we do appreciate you coming to speak to Council. Thank you again for the time and the opportunity. Thank you. So we do have uh, next on our list is speaker number two, Shiva Ole. Speaker two is not on the line. Thank you very much. We um, do we have speaker number three, Imtiaz Papit? Uh, no. Okay. So that brings us to the end of the speakers list. And given those two speakers I just called are our last and only two speakers um, left on the list, I'll consider um, our speakers list closed on this item and we will be moving to um, debate. And decision. So is there any decision, or sorry, any discussion, Council? Go ahead, Council Kirby Young. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I um, was asked, it was requested of me um, as the Council Liaison to the Race Committee, otherwise known as the Racial and Ethnocultural um, Equity Committee, if I could read a letter on their behalf um, into the record. So I'm going to try to do that quite quickly. Um, and it's um, penned by Stephanie Kallstrom, who serves as the Chair on behalf of the Committee. Dear Mayor and Council, I'm writing to you on behalf of the uh, Racial and Ethnocultural Equity Advisory Committee um, and our unanimous support for funding of legal costs for contributions to the Supreme Court case opposing Bill 21C. Considering the growing incidence of Islamophobia, we, the Race Committee, unequivocally denounce Bill 21. We know that this bill does not align with the City of Vancouver's values, nor does it align with Canadian values. The bill highlights continued inequality of racialized people municipally, provincially, and federally. The bill also further incites racism by providing a platform for racist people to confirm their agreement with the bill. We are concerned this will cause a ripple effect, including a further increase in Islamophobia, hate crimes, hate incidents and crimes. Our committee is calling on the city of Vancouver to join other cities around Canada in making their opposition known to Bill 21 by way of a sizable financial contribution to the legal costs opposing the bill. By doing so, the city of Vancouver is living true to their commitment of anti-racism and support of racialized community who are continuously underrepresented and excluded from municipal decisions. It will show true allyship by the City of Vancouver and a step in reconciling the many exclusionary actions and decisions that have been made for and to racialized people. Refusing to make a financial contribution will show, simply show the little value the City of Vancouver holds for issues that concern racialized communities. We, the Race Committee, know it is not equitable to take funding from work related to Vancouver's equity-deserving communities as outlined in the equity framework and city of reconciliation and other equity focus work and community engagement, considering how the bill amplifies inequality of racialized people. Therefore, taking money from our work would be unacceptable. The Reese Committee also encourages all municipalities in BC and nationwide to contribute financially to the Supreme Court case opposing Bill 21C, which shows allyship and the city's stance on racism. So that's the end of the letter that I was asked to read into the record, and I can share a bit of context for Council having attended the last Racial Equity Committee meeting. The committee had a robust discussion on this item, um, did agree to that they wanted to provide financial support. Um, they also had a discussion around a sizable contribution, and the motion that they passed was actually an ask for $100,000, um, not the $10,000 that you see in the motion. And at um, one point during the meeting, there was also a um, consideration given to 
a half million dollars or a $500,000 amount. So in terms of just providing some of the facts and updates to council on the nature of what the committee's discussion was, I just wanted to share that for the record. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kirby-Young. We will move to um, Councillor Carr. Actually, yes, thanks, Councilor, Chair. Councillor Carr, and those on the queue, I just am going to ask our clerks, we are in a question queue right now. We need to move back to the main queue. So I'm just noting that it's Councillor Carr, Councillor Hardwick, and Councillor Swanson, and we'll put you back on the list on the main queue now. Go ahead, Councillor Carr. Want me to, there. Okay, there you go. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and uh, actually, uh, you might want to move me to an amendment queue. I did forward an amendment to Council this morning. Okay, I'll move us to an amendment queue. And uh, just ask you to put yourself back on the queue, Councilor Carr. Yes, I can. And please go ahead and introduce your amendment. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, my my amendment really speaks to the issue that um, that I asked of Ms. Carr, uh, which is around the fact of uh, the need to really encourage people. Um, ourselves as counselors, people within the city, businesses, organizations, um, basically um, our society as a whole to get behind uh, this law case that is uh, in fact a, a one of incredible importance around, uh, around uh, social justice. Um, so my amendment um, is that uh, that mayor and council, that in us in our individual capacities be encouraged to promote and encourage people, businesses and organizations, including ourselves, to donate to the legal challenge to Quebec's Bill 21 that's led by the World Sikh Organization of Canada, the National Council of Canadian Muslims, and the Canadian Civil Liberties Association. Um, there is, in fact, um, a specific tax deductible donation portal that's now available for this on the Canadian Civil Liberties Association website. And um, uh, I can cir circulate that. Well, I'm going to tweet about it, um, so you can pick it up that way too. But um, it does, um, Councillor Swanson said, I really should mention uh, that there is a tax donation for it as well when you do donate. Um, uh, but to me, it's not about the tax donation. It's about a sense of solidarity um, with uh, people who are um, threatened with their uh, civil rights and liberties being taken away. And that's what Bill C-21 does. You know, I love Canada because we are not that melting pot. We are a mosaic and uh, we cherish and um, love the diversity that is this country, that is our city in particular, where the 50% of the people in Vancouver don't have English as a second language. Uh, so um, that's my um, amendment, and I'm um, very much hoping that uh, people will support it. I actually just donated. A, we, we did get a raise at the end of last year. I decided to, to put mine towards charitable causes, so I just donated $1,000 to that. Um, and uh, as I say, it's it's really, I believe, a worthwhile cause in the in, in the aim for real justice. Thank you, Councillor Carr. Um, so we do have that amendment on the floor. Councillor Swanson to the amendment. Yeah, um, I support the amendment, and I'll make a donation. But I don't think we should support this amendment as an alternative to having the city show our support as the city of Vancouver for this cause. I think um, I'm, I'm not proud of everything the city does, but I am proud of some things the city d does, like being uh, in favor of safe supply, being in favor of compassion clubs, um, you know, passing the tiny homes thing today. You know, I'm proud of those things. I would be proud of our city if we com contributed, well, I would like it to be the 100,000 that Brampton is doing, that uh, that was the minimum that our racial and ethnocultural equity committee wanted. But I reduced it to 10, thinking that maybe we could get a vote for it. Uh, I think it's, Victoria did uh, 9,500. It's just a tiny portion of our reserves will hardly make a dent in it. And I think it would be a great 
show of solidarity as a city rather than as individuals. We can do the individual part too, and we should, but I think we should do something as a city too. Um, I thought the presentation by the speaker was really, really eloquent, that this is a tangible action that we can take, that people in racialized minorities need to feel that their battle is everyone's battle, that giving money will help level the playing field, that it will show that we're willing to act. And what we say is what we do is a, more important than what we say. So yeah, I'll, I'll support the amendment. I think it's good, but I really think we need to support donating as a city too, and 10,000 isn't very much. Point of privilege, Chair. Uh, yes, just a quick one. I'm finding that the audio is really loud, it seems louder than usual in the chamber, and it's a little tough to take that volume for that long. I don't know if that's me, but it seems really loud. Okay, I'll make sure that um, our staff can take a look at that. I see, okay, that's helpful. So I just was informed by our staff that to hear the speakers calling in from the TELUS line, we tend to turn the audio up because we've just had speakers. So we can now turn it down because the counselor's audio through the WebEx is Thank you. a different line. Okay, great, thanks for raising that issue. Um, counselor Weeb. Yeah, I will be supporting the amendment. Um, and I wanna thank all the members of different organizations and the public that have reached out to us. And they've talked about how they want to see us stand in solidarity. They want us to show action on this. They want us to show that we do care. And I think I would love to not only donate, but also promote to others to show that Vancouver wants to stand united together um, on such an important cause. And so I'm really appreciative of this amendment coming forward because I think we do as a city in these tough times need to make sure that we are standing together united um, and i think bringing people together to support a cause and ten thousand is not enough and so that's why i like the fact that if we can garner support and we can show that this is coming from every community across the city um, that we're standing with you um, and i really appreciate how this amendment kind of brings us together so thanks to the mover of the mo amendment and uh, looking forward to continuing to see us kind of push this um, solidarity effort and try to get other cities and municipalities to join us. Thank you, uh, Councillor Weep. And that does bring us to uh, the end of Councillors on the Queue, so we'll go to a vote on the amendment. And that amendment does pass with none in opposition. Well, thank you very much, Councillor Carr, for bringing that forward. Um, we will now move back to the main queue. And Councillor Carr, you do have the floor. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, Councillor Swanson, for bringing this forward. And I know um, it's you know been a source of some consternation in, amongst councillors because of our recent process of going through our operating budget and uh, and painfully having to make decisions about what we couldn't fund in that budget and so many of those programs positions and and uh, uh, and endeavors by the city um, are really critical and it's a it's a very hard process nonetheless I really believe that we should as a city stand up for the kind of city and the kind of country we want um, and when the civil rights and liberties of um, uh, of major groups, um, you know, the, this uh, Bill 21 doesn't just target um, the, the Islamic community, um, it doesn't just target the Jewish community, it really targets everyone um, in Canada, because if you can take away the rights of one group, why can't a government take away the rights of another group? Um, I think we have to stand united. I think we have to support those who are um, taking on um, this fight for justice and equality and freedom of, uh, and civil rights. And um, so thank you. Thank you, Jean. Thank you to all the speakers. Um, thank you to our committees who have weighed in on this, our advisory committees. I really appreciate um, their input as well. 
So I stand in support of this motion. Thank you, Councilor Carr. Councilor Hardwick. Thank you. Um, this is a legal challenge in uh, the province of Quebec. Um, we can support, uh, support the legal challenge, and I don't think anybody would dispute that that's something that we can and should do. Um, it does hearken me back, though, as, as I think going back many years, um, as we think about the ever-broadening scope of the things that we are touching at City Council. Uh, I was reminded about uh, Vancouver becoming a nuclear-free zone uh, back many years ago and the long list that has joined that since. We all want to do the right thing, but at the end of the day, the money that we're spending are, is public funds that comes directly or indirectly from our residents. And given uh, um, the constraints on our, our uh, budget, we can't fund everything. So I would like to sever this motion. I would like to uh, support uh, A and C, but uh, I will not be uh, supporting B. Thank you, Councillor Hardwick. Um, Councillor Boyle. Please help me brief. This was been, been articulated well already that this is um, absolutely a, a critical justice issue, uh, not just for residents in Quebec, but for folks across the country. And we've heard that very clearly from speakers, from the emails we've been getting. Um, and so I uh, will be supporting the whole motion. Okay, thank you very much, Councillor Boyle. Uh, Councillor Fry. Yeah, thanks. Um, I appreciate that Councillor Swanson has brought this back uh, with a, a more reasonable ask. I, I was really struggling with the original financial ask because I felt that it was not really fair given the amount of cuts we had to make to critical uh, services here in the city of Vancouver in our last budget round, including a lot of equity seeking pieces and arts and culture and uh, reconciliation and, and a bunch of stuff that, that we also need to take care of here in the city of Vancouver. Uh, so I appreciate that this is a, a far more modest ask, and, and really, if we want to be accurate, you know, given the extent of our financial resources, it is a it is somewhat uh, symbolic, even token. Um, but I think it is an important symbol for us to send. I'm one of the lucky folks uh, here who's an immigrant to this country, and we came to this country um, because Canada was. Uh, when we came here, uh, it was a beacon of inclusivity, and and uh, that meant a lot. That meant a lot to be able to, and as an immigrant myself, and as a city that is comprised of a lot of folks who are immigrants from other parts of the world who flee, fled uh, difficult situations and come to build a better life and be part of an inclusive and vibrant society that Canada offers, and specifically Vancouver offers. And, been so blessed to watch Vancouver's multiculturalism grow over the the 40 something or almost 50 years that I've lived here um, so I, I, I do want to um, really speak to this is an, an important symbolic thing for us to do as Canadians and it's why I'm proud to be a Canadian and, and I think um, it's a sign of, of respect and appreciation uh, for what it is to be a Canadian uh, when we challenge this really wrong-headed approach that Quebec is taking. Um, and we look more at, at this not as an as a anti-Quebec thing, but as a pro-Canada thing and, and really bring us together. And I, and I, yeah, yeah, so I'll be voting in support. And I'll be donating as well. Thank you, Councillor Fry. Councillor Dominato. Uh, thank you, Chair. Sorry, just coming off mute. Um, uh, appreciate the, the dialogue that's been had around this um, issue, and it, it is one of importance. Uh, it's actually um, denouncing Bill 21 uh, was a motion that I and Councillor Kirby Young brought uh, well over a year and a half ago, two years ago, um, in light of concerns raised um, around it, the bill and the implications, and, and obviously it is now before the courts. Uh, and so absolutely recognizing uh, that we do not support that um, this being said, um, I think we really need to ground ourselves uh, in the fact that we have a responsibility 
um, to our residents and taxpayers here. And so while I have many friends who are Muslim, who are Sikh within a number of communities, um, I also am accountable to the public around how we use public taxpayer dollars. And when I look at this, I have a laundry list of items that residents have asked me for and have asked this council for to support and to fund. And so it's with that in mind that I'm approaching this decision and the proposal to, to offer a grant as part of this, this court case. I'm happy to contribute personally and would certainly encourage others to do so. Um, but at this juncture, particularly after the last number of budgets and the recognition uh, that we are, um, that we have many, many um, challenges in our own backyard here and we don't seem to have enough resources to address a number of those challenges, um, I can't support uh, the financial ask in this motion today. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dominato. Councillor Swanson, uh, closing on your motion. Yeah, um, we just came off a week or so ago, the National Day of Action and Remembrance on Islamophobia. And we've all heard about the five precious folks that were lost at that Quebec mosque five years ago. And then an innocent Muslim family that was killed by a car last year in Quebec, in Ontario, I mean. And last year I talked to an amazing Muslim teenager who was assaulted on a Vancouver bus because she was wearing a hijab. Um, so if our Canadian court allows one province to infringe on religious freedom, it means that all provinces could. I know we don't have a lot of money, but we do have a reserve fund of about 45 million. And so I reduced the ask of our uh, racial ethnocultural committee for this motion. I reduced it from over 100,000 down to a measly 10, just so the city can show in a concrete way that we as a city, not as individuals, but as a city, have the backs of people who are gonna be discriminated against because of this bill. Um, Nice words about how bad discrimination are, it are better than no words, but nice words plus action are a way better way to show real solidarity. And you know, some, some people have said, we have to be accountable to our residents and our taxpayers. Well, our residents are Muslims, our residents are Sikhs, our residents are racialized minorities who can be discriminated against, who are victims of hate that bills like this encourage. So I think we have a responsibility as a city to at least give a little token of our solidarity with these groups and um, I, I'm going to, I think Councillor Hardwick asked for the motion to be severed. I think that's a good idea. Um, but I think, I'm hoping we can all vote for the measly 10,000 to throw in as a city. That's it. Thank you, Councillor Swanson. Councillor Kirby Young. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I don't want to add too much because I think that um, a number of councillors have spoken to it. I just want to add one thing, and I think that it's really important that we also take actions here at home. And I appreciated Councillor Swanson's reference to um, the young teenager on the bus um, who had that horrible experience. We've had a number of our communities who have had horrible and difficult experiences that the pandemic has exacerbated a lot of tensions and a lot of perspectives underneath. And we've heard from our Jewish community, increased incidents of anti-Semitism, of um, hateful um, graffitis, of swastikas um, in public places or in front of homes. We've heard, saw the Kamigado Maru Memorial deface. We've had a number of incidents of anti-Asian racism, um, particularly targeting a lot of vulnerable people, including um, seniors of Asian descent um, who have been knocked down in stores and uh, are afraid to walk to get their daily groceries. And we've seen that, and so we've had opportunities at council such as 
um, when we had a motion that I brought forward to move forward with an anti, uh, sort of a, a broad-based anti-racism, anti-hate strategy for the city of Vancouver to speak to all of our communities that were feeling the very real impacts of that. And council referred that motion. We didn't feel urgency around it at that time. And that's what I mean in terms of there are some very real things that I think we can do here and we should be doing with some more urgency. But for me, a lot of it is about being true to the principle and looking after those things. And I can't reconcile and align decisions like that. Um, and we hear those stories of people that are experiencing those situations every day that are being called names on our streets. Um, and we are not taking enough action, I believe, right here in the city of Vancouver. So there's a lot more that I could say about this. Um, I think I'll leave it there for now. I may come back. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Kirby Young. Um, next, we have Mayor Stewart. Thanks, Chair. Um, you know, there's all kinds of things we might do and uh, should do in the future, but here's the choice in front of us right now. And it'd be embarrassing not to fund this, so please vote yes for both if you're severing. Thank you. Uh, next, Councillor Fry. Yeah, and I think Mayor Stewart really, really touched on, 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 on something there. And I, I think it's important to just kind of frame this, that voting against this, now that it's a significantly modest ask that really has no consequence but for the symbolism on, on our budget, um, it says something about who we are as a council, who we are as a city, uh, to turn it down. Um, you know, some of you would have seen the reports of a young Indigenous woman who, along with her two friends, were beaten up by a guy over the weekend, a Freedom Convoy-related guy who, the Vancouver is awesome, posted his link to his profile. The guy is literally a white supremacist, and he's walking around beating up teenagers in our city. Um, and if we sort of turn around and say, you know what, we're, we're good with uh, letting this one slide because $10,000 is not something that the good people of Vancouver would, would condone, I think that says far too much about, about who we are as a city. And um, that would be really unfortunate, so. Thank you very much, Councillor Fry. So that does bring us to the end of the um, speakers list and we do have a request to sever. So we will move to a voting queue and we'll go through and vote separately on uh, all three resolutions, A, B, and C. So we'll start at the voting on A. And that motion passes with none in opposition. And then we will be voting on B. Just giving the clerks a moment to switch between screens. And that motion does fail with Councillors Hardwick Councillor Dominato, Councillor Kirby Young, and myself in opposition. And then finally, we'll vote on C. Point, point of um, a privilege, I guess it is. Um, could you just review that again? I'm sorry, I didn't, you said it failed, but maybe I looked at it wrong, but I saw six so in favor. Of it does require two thirds of council, so eight oh, votes right. in I'm the so affirmative. Sorry. Yeah. Apologies, I you hadn't. Yes, I'm sorry. So just in the I'm middle sorry. of a vote, so I'll just ask um, us to continue. That's okay, Council Carr. Thanks for raising that. Um, so resolution C. And that motion passes with none in opposition. So that does bring us to the end of um, item five and just want to thank the speakers um, for, for uh, joining us for that 
item. We're now moving to item six on the agenda. Um, this is the third referred motion, a previously motion before aligning Vancouver's 2023 to 2026 capital plan with increased climate emergency action, which was moved and introduced by Councillor Carr and seconded by Councillor Boyle. And we do have uh, speakers for this motion. Our first speaker is here in person, Nathan Davidovich. You have five minutes to speak to council. Isn't Councillor Carr is not introducing the motion again? Or? The motion was introduced yesterday. Oh, and then okay. Referred to okay. Today. okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Chair and members of council. Um, uh, I support uh, the motion and to allocate uh, more resources uh, to climate change. Uh, this is the whole problem is that uh, many other cities are not following Vancouver and not allocating uh, money or, or even applying for money to, to, uh, for climate change. So it should be really mandatory or the provincial government should mandate that through Clean BC, uh, so Washington State is doing some mandating, and the same thing in California, where they have way, way more uh, progressive laws uh, to combat uh, the climate change. The problem I have uh, here in Vancouver uh, that we are continuing with this process of referendum uh, for capital plan and and uh, what's going to happen if 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 George and uh, Batman uh, uh, who killed the 2015 transit referendum will campaign against the 2022 referendum of the city of Vancouver you know uh, it might not pass and uh, uh, you know, we need a proper plan, capital plan, without a referendum. Uh, other cities in, uh, in BC don't hold referendum. And uh, it has to be a proper plan to include all the climate emergency actions and uh, infrastructure items like sidewalk and lighting to upgrade them to the current uh, standards uh, so people can uh, feel safe and can walk uh, uh, instead of using their cars for every trip that uh, that exists so these are my comments thank you thank you very much Nathan uh, there are no questions but we do appreciate you coming next on the list is speaker number two Peter McCartney Hello, I'm here. Can you Hi. hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, you do have five minutes to speak to council. Please go ahead. Great, thanks. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me in to speak today. Uh, as some of you may know, I'm the climate campaigner for the Wilderness Committee. Uh, we represent uh, over 10,000 uh, supporters in Vancouver, and I just want to call to give the uh, Wilderness Committee's full support for this motion. Um, I want to thank this council for its leadership in climate action and uh, for the climate emergency action plan. And, you know, we've seen time and time again with uh, governments at all levels that we develop excellent plans that don't get the funding they need to see it through. And so I think this motion uh, is sort of where the rubber hits the road. Um, the 2023 to 2027 capital plan will make or break our city's 2030 climate targets. Um, and, you know, it, it, it does take money to uh, address climate change. But, of course, we are already paying the cost of climate change um, through the damage to our uh, public infrastructure uh, with the atmospheric rivers. And more importantly than in dollars, then we're already paying the cost in lives. Um, you know, as this motion highlights, the 99 Vancouverites who perished uh, tragically in the heat wave earlier last year. Um, so 
So I'm asking you to support this motion. Uh, I know that the COVID-19 pandemic has done a number on public budgets everywhere, um, but I think it also showed that government can spend uh, the money it needs to to address emergencies, and this is an emergency. Um, if we use it to as an excuse to delay climate action any longer, uh, you know, we're accepting more of these climate disasters and more costs uh, for our cities and our communities. Um, instead, I think we should use it as inspiration uh, for what an emergency response looks like, and we can show other levels of government that uh, the public is interested and, and wants um, them to show up with the kind of financial uh, muscle we're going to have to take in order to address climate change. Uh, so that's all I have to say. Uh, just uh, really recommend that you support this motion and keep Vancouver on track to uh, being able to meet the ambitious climate goals it's set out for. Thanks. Thank you very much, Peter. You do have questions, Councillor Carr, up to three minutes. Great, thanks so much. Um, really appreciate you taking the time to, to come to speak to this motion. I'm very interested in knowing, um, having been familiar with the, the Wilderness Committee, uh, you do a canvas, you get out and reach out to the public, um, large membership-based organization. What are your members and what are your canvassers hearing at the door about people's concerns around climate? Uh, climate change is the first thing people wanna talk about. Um, at the door are our canvassers that uh, uh, are in touch with the public at every opportunity um, are hearing a real fear um, from people about the impacts of climate change in our community and a, and a desire for our governments to um, be matching the urgency of the situation. I think uh, in the last year, climate change has become uh, incredibly real for members of the public in a way that it seemed distant before. And, um, you know, people are really wanting to know that the, uh, the decision makers that represent them are taking this crisis seriously and are responding with, um, with the kind of power that it warrants. So, uh, definitely it's, it's, um, it's all we hear about. <laughs> Thanks. That's, affirming for me really appreciate that and and uh, keep up your good work thank you very much uh council car peter those are all your questions thank you for coming to speak to council thank you next we have tom digby this is speaker number three tom digby yes hi good afternoon uh, can you hear me we can uh, thank you very much for coming to speak to council you have five minutes please go ahead Thank you, uh, Mayor and Councillors, for uh, having me in today. I did send some slides through, um, a few simple images. Uh, are, are those available to you all? Yes, we do have the slides up on the screen. There is a slight delay if you're viewing uh, from home, but we will advance the slides if you let us know when to do so. Got it. So my name is Tom Digby, and uh, I'm speaking in favour of Member Motion Number 4, um, I think it's an outstanding and timely motion, uh, which really will go a long way uh, to help us vote in favor of the capital plan when it comes to a vote. Um, now, I know uh, you down at City Hall, you've got a big project. The plan's going to be about $3 billion or something north of that. It's a four-year plan, and it's going to address all the urgent priorities that uh, you're all uh, busy prioritizing. And uh, I know you all get... Uh, you'll have uh, quite a time sorting that through, um, but I love the lens that this motion puts on that, which is, uh, for example, to uh, report the estimated GHG costs and the benefits and the various features of the plan. So um, I totally support this motion. And I wanted to add on the next slide a simple contribution to what might enhance the motion, or perhaps um, it could just be used to inform uh, the capital planning process. Because on the second slide, I see another way to see this capital plan is, is a major investment, multi-billion dollar investment directed to heavy construction in the city. And I see it as tons of concrete being poured, tons of iron and steel being used, and truckloads of asphalt being dumped on the roads uh, where we need it um, as efficiently as possible 
uh, over the course of the next four years of the plan. And my simple question as a voter, when uh, we see it on the ballot in October, is going to be, you know, what is the embodied carbon cost of this capital plan? Now, uh, I'm not going to um, uh, uh, get into embodied carbon costs. I think you're all quite familiar with it. I've seen many uh, council reports on what the embodied carbon cost is, uh, what that means and how it's calculated. Um, uh, there's uh, been many reports. It's been a, a big feature of the uh, Climate Emergency Action Plan. I've seen it there. And there was actually one line in the, um, in the annual report I saw from November that said that um, regarding materials, um, the, by 2030, the embodied emissions from new buildings and construction will be reduced by 40% compared to the 2018 baseline. And what I would like to do is make sure that that um, is found somewhere in the, the uh, capital plan. And so if you go to the last slide, then I'll, here's what I'm asking is that please ask staff to report on the embodied carbon cost of the plan. So of all the construction we're going to do, and if you could specifically, I mean, I acknowledge that's a tough number to figure out. Um, if there's a lot of uh, life cycle assessment is a challenge and not many uh, uh, municipalities around North America do this yet. But Vancouver has a huge opportunity to take the lead and make it clear and if you could specify the specific amounts of concrete, iron, and steel, and asphalt that are going to be used to fulfill the plan, then those of us who vote on it can be confident that we know what we're voting in favor on. I mean, the capital plan needs to be a winning document because you want to get the voters to vote in favor of it. But there's a risk if the full embodied carbon cost of the plan is there and you're not telling the people the true cost of what we're doing. So I'll leave it at that for now and uh, thank you very much for your time. I hope we can see these numbers in the plan when it goes to plebiscite later in the year. Thank you very much. You do have a question from uh, Councillor Kirby Young. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, and thanks for speaking to Council. A couple questions I just wanted to clarify. Um, when you said in terms of people or residents being able to see the true cost, are you advocating that we evaluate climate projects based on balancing the sort of reduction in GHG impact and the financial cost of those projects and that we prioritize accordingly the ones that have the higher reduction and the lower cost? So the main motion speaks to that already. And yes, I, I think we should do that. <clears throat> My aspect of it that I'm asking you to look at is really whatever you do come up with, is just to tell us how much carbon, how many megatons, is it 40 megatons, is it 100 megatons of carbon that we, we will use in the next uh, four years to build our city? And I realize that this is just a small percentage of all the building in the city. I mean, what is this, our plan? Is it 5% of the entire build in the city, maybe only 2%? I don't even know. But as we can set the standard and show people this is how you measure embodied carbon cost, and then we can start to ask our, uh, our, our developers and builders to give us the same numbers. Have you, so thanks for that. Have you um, been following the climate emergency regular report back to council where targets are set? It identifies the amount of emissions from transportation from buildings and it sets targets and reductions in the regular reports back that council already receives on that. I believe it's quarterly. I'm familiar with some of them. That is the operational carbon cost. And what we're looking at here is the capital plan for the next four years, which is a uh, different budget item. And I would think it should be uh, specified more specifically here. Okay. They're, they actually over. They actually overlap. Um, they are. There's policy certainly in, in the other plan, but there's also capital costs. The other questions you mentioned in terms of um, public being able to see the amount specifically and looking to approve the capital plan. But are you also aware that the public doesn't approve specific projects, it just approves an overall borrowing envelope that covers all of the categories that um, City of Vancouver will be spending money on in the four years? Sure, uh, I am and it should say, you know, $3 billion and uh, 40 uh, megatons of carbon dioxide. I mean, those, you know, we'll vote in favor of that plan. Okay. Uh, 
I guess my question, if I'm zeroing in on it, is what is it about this motion that stands out as the most important for you? What is new? Because I struggled in looking at it to determine what was new versus the direction that council has already given through the climate emergency plan. Uh, I will decline to answer that. I think it's uh, a valuable in, uh, initiative and reminder of what needs to be looked at in the capital plan. Okay. Thanks for speaking to council. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, over to Council Carr for questions of speaker. Yes. Um, thanks, Tom, so much for coming to speak. Um, and what an innovative idea. Uh, I think we are moving towards embodied carbon, certainly in the buildings and, and the measurements we're, we're taking there. Um, uh, uh, more specifically, moving to reduce the um, uh, or protect the embodied emissions that are currently existing in buildings. But this is a much bigger ask you're asking for. So Councillor Kirby Young did um, say that the detailed plan, of course, it's not going to be distributed with a ballot, but it will be, we will land on it beforehand. So you'll see inf information there. I think it's a good idea and I plan to ask uh, staff how they can um, deal with embodied emissions. Um, uh, you know, as the, and it, yeah, just how they can deal with embodied emissions. So thanks for the, for the idea. Thank you, Council Carr. And uh, those are all your questions, um, Tom. We do appreciate you coming to speak to Council. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we have speaker number four, uh, Devyani Singh. Yeah, hi. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you for calling in today. You have five minutes. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, I'm Dr. Devyani Singh. I'm a climate scientist and a resident of the city of Vancouver. Uh, I'm here today to speak in support of this really important and timely motion, which is to align Vancouver's 2023-2026 uh, capital plan with the increased climate emergency action, uh, much like all the other speakers before me. Uh, the science is clear about needing rapid change and reduction in our emissions within the next decade. And we need to take this bold action now to avert disastrous outcomes. Uh, from what I understand, the next capital plan will take us almost to 2030 by the time it is implemented by when the city of Vancouver has committed to reduce its emissions by 50%. Thus, this next plan needs to include those pathways and actions needed to reach that reduction. Uh, in my scientific work, I have also helped municipalities in the US create just climate action plans. And one of the things we recommend was the importance of these bold steps over the next decade and to do everything within the control of the municipalities, while of course pushing for more provincial and federal support. The city of Vancouver is already doing a lot when it comes to uh, climate emergency and taking action on it, but we are not doing enough and there's still a lot of room for improvement. And I feel some of these within city limit actions that could be done, which would be to support climate justice measures, which cover climate and other important issues like housing as well, uh, could be things like deep retrofits of municipal buildings, social non-market rental housing and childcare facilities. Uh, you know, along with increasing tree canopy across the city, this would make us resilient for future extreme climate events such as the heat domes and extreme cold we experienced in the last year. Uh, we also need to ensure improvements to transit, accessible transit, and more safe walking and biking infrastructure. I don't want to take too much time in speaking. Uh, I really think this is an important motion. And to conclude, I ask that Council support this motion to ensure that Vancouver continues to be a climate leader and that we can hit our emissions tar reductions targets Taking action now is much cheaper than paying the economic and social costs of climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Devyani. You do have questions, Councillor Carr. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Singh, Devyani, uh, for coming to speak. I'm very interested in the work you said that um, you are a climate scientist and you have helped cities um, in the United States develop uh, just climate action plans. What have been your big biggest challenges in uh, in moving forward just um, climate action plans at the city level? I think one of the biggest challenges is, uh, you know, it is a uh, pushback from uh, a lot of developers about, you know, putting in new regulations when it comes to net zero buildings, which the city of Vancouver is already doing great on the residential front in that, uh, in that, uh, for that thing. Uh, but I think, um, what the most interest was, was, and I feel it's an equity issue, it's a justice issue, it's a social issue, and it's a climate issue, is retrofitting uh, buildings. And retrofitting those starting with the oldest and those in the poor and uh, low-income neighborhoods. Uh, because those are the ones that uh, you know, pay the price of uh, climate change. 
And so when um, so that was some of the uh, pushback. And I actually worked with really small municipalities. They were townships, and so uh, they, it was really hard for them to find the money. But a city like Vancouver, I think we do have the resources to be able to uh, push for some of these uh, low-hanging, easy fruit that hit equity and center equity as we take climate action. Mm, great, and, and um, thank you. That's that's helpful. Uh, what have been um, sort of the biggest achievements that you've been able to move forward? Uh, you know, through yeah, through your work. Um, well, I recommended these only last year, so the city is, um, uh, and after that, I uh, changed my uh, job, so I don't know uh, how far they have reached uh, in implementing these plans, uh, but I do know that uh, the city council or the township council, and one of them had a board because they were small towns, uh, were very happy and had been in full support of uh, what we had put forward. Uh, so I would say that that was a win, that uh, every, there was buy-in from everybody across the, uh, on, on the board and the council uh, in the uh, recommendations we had put forward. Excellent, great. Thanks for your work and thanks for coming to talk to council, appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, there are no further questions. Next, we have uh, Deborah Ann Curry. Yes, hello. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please uh, go ahead. You have five minutes. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Dr. Deborah Curry. I'm a family physician in Vancouver on the territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. And I am a subcommittee member of the BC Division of the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment. I am speaking in support of this motion. I am a busy working physician. We are in the middle of, of a global pandemic, but the pandemic is not what keeps me up at night worrying. Climate change does. This September, more than 200 leading medical journals stated that climate change is the globe's greatest public health threat, not COVID-19, climate change. It is time for us all to treat climate change as a health emergency that requires urgent action backed with a large amount of funding and planning. So I urge you to pass motion B4 by Councillor Carr. I am perhaps one of the few or the only physicians in BC who has lost more than one patient to climate change this past year. Just a few days ago, I was comforting a family member who had lost somebody they loved in 2021 to a climate change disaster. Their life will never be the same and the shock of losing someone in such a nonsensical way is devastating. Last year, we lost approximately 600 people to the heat domes that devastated our province at the beginning of our summer. And last summer, residents, farmers, and growers across British Columbia struggled with drought and wildfires. My niece and nephews in Kamloops had to stay inside most of the summer because the smoke outside wasn't safe for their little lungs to breathe. The floods this fall claimed the homes and livelihoods of hundreds and seriously impacted the economy and infrastructure in BC. After the floods this fall, a colleague of mine provided counseling for those devastated by the floods that would not have been possible without climate change. The look in her eyes after hearing their stories was haunted. We know from research that as climate change progresses, we will see more heat domes, drought, desertification, ocean acidification, wildfires, and other extreme weather events. The heat dome this summer was devastating, but we are still producing carbon as a society, and if we do not act boldly and swiftly in climate mitigation and adaptation, the health costs of climate change will escalate. Imagine a summer with an even longer heat dome or multiple heat domes. Extreme heat will cause more heat-related illnesses and deaths, especially among those who are living in poverty or among the elderly. Forest fire smoke, increased smog, dust from droughts and pollen will all increase the risk of heart and lung disease. Extreme rainfall and drought may cause food and waterborne illnesses, increased air pollutants caused by climate change cause increased rates of cancer, and extreme weather events such as atmospheric rivers, tornadoes, and winter storms put BC residents at risk of illness, injury, death, and poor mental health as communities struggle to cope with power outages, food and water quality concerns, environmental exposures, evacuations, and financial hardship after these events. Disaster recovery costs may be unmanageable for those with financial insecurity. Indeed, we have heard stories this fall of people racking up all credit available to them to recover from the floods. Undoubtedly, these health impacts will affect those living in poverty more, and this is a major concern for equity and resilience among those living in our city. 
I am here because myself and my colleagues are seeing the health effects of climate change in our offices, in our personal lives, in our mental health. We are seeing it affect our patients' well-being and their livelihoods. In my office, I am seeing that the public is horrified about the last year of heat domes, droughts, fires, and floods. People are desperate to see all levels of government acting like this is an emergency. COVID-19 has shown us what we can do in a health emergency and how important it is to listen to scientists. Climate change is a bigger health emergency than COVID-19. It is the biggest potential health disaster we have ever faced. We have seen what happens when our health systems are underfunded with COVID-19. We have already seen the effects of climate change on our health in BC. To keep communities healthy, we need to prioritize funding for climate action. There are so many benefits to acting quickly and boldly, including in decreasing air pollution and stimulating the economy with all the work required to take climate action. So please take urgent action in supporting Motion B to provide the, the sorry, Motion 4, to provide the important long-term planning for the funding required for climate change mitigation and adaptation in Vancouver. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. You do have questions, Deborah. Uh, one from Councillor uh, Carr. Go ahead, Councillor Carr. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Curry, for coming to speak to us. I really appreciate it and the work of you and your organization. Um, I'm interested in your experience as a family physician within Vancouver and uh, having experienced uh, extreme weather events we had because of, uh, of the climate uh, emergency and the accelerated changes that are going on. Um, my motion does uh, stipulate or call for some specific measures um, such as retrofitting, um, housing, retrofitting, um, civic buildings or facilities like uh, community centers, libraries, childcare, um, in order to provide places of refuge for people in extreme heat or cold or air quality or other kinds of events. Have you, um, as an organization, talked about the need for that or how would you respond to a call for those kinds of um, investments in Vancouver? Deborah, are you there? That's okay. Sorry, Councilor Carr, I'm just going to stop your timer and make sure we've got uh, our speaker on the line. I'm here. Can anyone hear me? Okay, yes, we have your audio back now. So did you hear the question from Councilor Carr? I did hear the question. Um, so I was, I was going to say I'm not an expert um, in this. I'm a family physician, and so I have experience on the ground, and I can speak to that. Um, as an organization, we have not discussed that specific question that, um, that Councillor Carr was asking, but I can say that from my experience as a family physician, um, those types of things are essential. Um, the people who were struggling the most uh, during the heat dome were people who did not have access to cooling and um, perhaps were not aware uh, or did not have the connections did not have the family to to let them know that they needed to go to places to keep cool and so I think that um, part of the solution is making people aware when these things happen that uh, like heat domes um, that they need to go to places that provide cooling and um, absolutely that sort of infrastructure is essential great thank you again thank you for the work that you're doing Thank you. And thank you very much uh, for coming, for calling in to speak to Council Deborah and for waiting on the line. Those are actually, we do have a, uh, yes, those are all your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So just moving us back to the main queue and we do, um, th so that's the end of our speakers list. Council, um, thanks everyone who did call in to speak to Council. We're moving to a discussion on this item and I see Council Kirby Young is uh, first on the queue. Go ahead, Council Kirby Young. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I have sent in an amendment for Council's consideration as an addition to the motion as an additional clause. Okay, if I may just move us to an amendment queue. And, um, oh, sure. There we go. So please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, and this amendment is really in the spirit of um, asking Council to sort of be fulsome in our consideration of capital projects and other priorities that we have identified. And so, um, it, the additional clause asks for also bringing information back um, early in the budget process consistent um, with the structure of the earlier clauses. 
a list of potential capital projects for addressing Vancouver's combined sewer overflows in support of the commitment to accelerate action on overflow reduction using a one water integrated approach with associated cost and environmental benefits. And you'll recall council has committed and had discussions with respect to the one water approach and the use of gray and green infrastructure. Um, and really this recognizes that with the extreme climate events that we're having, we will see things like um, increased flooding, for example, um, I think on deck, I was gonna say earlier this week, it was just yesterday, um, we had a um, infrastructure funding ask for a sewer and um, associated rain capture, water capture project, uh, Columbia Park, um, as one example of some of this work. And so in terms of looking holistically, um, not just at buildings, but also some of those other critical infrastructure that can have an impact with respect to flooding, um, we see it um, as well in terms of potential linkages to water quality. We see the E. coli and Falls Creek and the beach closures and shutdowns, um, the impact in terms of wildlife in general across the city um, when we have overflows into our systems. Um, and so I think that this is also an important additional consideration that we look to. Um, potentially, uh, I would say, especially as the city is densifying and we need to have those um, sort of the appropriate water capture and separation, but also the permeable surfaces and other aspects as we have denser buildings and more concrete in the city, um, it becomes more of an issue in between, and especially with an aging um, sewer system. And we have seen that we are behind um, in terms of our rate. We've been picking up the pace a little bit, but are still far below sort of the one to 2% um, target um, for separation. And we've seen some real, I think, um, opportunities for innovation around um, creative um, approaches uh, in terms of balancing, again, I'd say that gray and green infrastructure to this. So I think it would be really beneficial for council to have information back um, as well on these additional types of projects that are also an important part of climate action. And that's the spirit of the amendment. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Councillor Kirby-Young. Um, Councillor Carr to the amendment. Yes, thank you. Appreciate that amendment, Councillor Kirby Young. I think it's a good one. Um, you know, I, the last two terms on council, um, despite the incredible volumes of money coming in from the development that was going on in the city, um, uh, the, the the city did not um, invest in uh, to the degree in sewer the. Um, separation of our sewer system and in a one water approach uh, that we needed to. We are behind the gun. Um, I think the storms that we've seen, the incredible high um, high volume rainstorms with uh, you know the, the pictures and, and experiences of that water bubbling out of, um, of the sewers onto our streets, it's pretty appalling. We know we have to deal with this. So um, it is a climate emergency action in my mind um, because uh, of the increased volume of rain that scientists are predicting that we are going to experience and, and will only increase over time. So uh, good addition. Great, thank you very much, Councillor Carr. Seeing no one else on the queue, we can move to a vote on this um, amendment. And that uh, motion does pass with no one in opposition. Thank you very much, Councillor Kirby Young. You do have uh, the floor. We're back on the main queue. I'm fine for now, thanks. Great, thank you very much. Um, Councillor Carr. I'm, well, there are others on it. I'll, I'll, I just wanted to end, but I didn't want to uh, leave the, I thought that I might've been the last, last person. I'll wait till Council, I, Councillor Boyle speaks. I can go ahead and, yeah. Okay, Councillor Boyle, over to you. Thanks, I just wanted to speak in support of this and, and thank Councillor Carr for the work she did uh, in drafting it to bring it forward. Uh, I think the, Timeline is especially important to emphasize the climate science is so clear uh, that every action we take now um, is significantly easier and less expensive than if we continue to delay uh, and punt the issue further down the road. And of course, that was also true 10 years and 20 years ago. And so what we're facing now is already a pretty a significant challenge um, and the less we do, the harder it will get for those that follow. Um, I remember so clearly the IPCC report that came out in October 2018 when we were all elected 
uh, that made clear that we had 12 years to dramatically decarbonize in order to have any hope of uh, maintaining what we know of as civilized uh, human life on the planet. Um, we are three years into those years. Uh, this capital plan, as Councillor Carr uh, laid out so clearly in the motion, um, will take us through the next significant chunk of those 12 years. Uh, and so it absolutely has to have a very strong climate focus to line up with the policy and regulatory tools uh, that our climate action plan is also moving urgently forward on. Um, I, I, I feel very strongly uh, that this is an incredibly important piece of the decisions that we will make as a council in the next six months. Uh, and uh, I will continue to say that and I, and I'm grateful for Councillor Carr's leadership on this as well. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Councillor Boyle. Over to Councillor Dominato. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Through you um, to the city manager, I just have a point of information. Uh, sure, go ahead and pose your, your point of information. Yes, thank you. Um, to the city manager, just uh, given that we're only partway through getting briefings on the preparation of the four-year capital plan and um, uh, through that, we're learning about some of the different pieces we'll be looking at in terms of renewal and new infrastructure and maintenance. Um, could you comment on if council supporting this motion today, does that mean it will supersede staff doing an analysis um, of the necessary infrastructure needed across the city um, in a number of different domains? Because I think this is really important around the resilient infrastructure, but obviously we have a variety of capital needs. So could you comment on what that means? Does it trump other priorities, um, uh, if you give me some context as how this will be interpreted. Thanks, Chair, through you. Um, thanks for the question. We're, we're not interpreting it as that. Ultimately, at the end of the day, Council is going to have to make trade-off decisions in the context of all the information that you receive from us regarding capital plan for the next four years. Um, it does, we read the motion as setting out certain information that Council would, again, if it passes, certain information that Council is going to be looking for. Uh, for that purpose, so we would be identifying those things as a consideration. Um, but ultimately, at, again, at the end of the day, the the allocation of money within the capital plan envelope will will be made by council, um, you know, as the final step in that process. So we're not seeing as precluding that. Okay, and and one set, last question on that note: Could you comment just in general how that what that process will look like in terms of? Council undertaking uh, that work, just so the public understands what that's going to look like, and also for those of us uh, who have never gone through the four-year capital planning process, since there's only, I think, two councillors who have been through that process. Yes, thanks through the chair, and, and we are looking at it differently than we have in the past. Um, we're contemplating um, a, a set of likely two uh, workshops that would actually be convened as special meetings. Um, where in we would have an opportunity to present information and some detail uh, and provide council an opportunity to discuss that and provide us input back, both on the renewal component of the capital plan as well as the growth side. Um, we would then use that input to draft a plan, uh, which we'll bring back to council. That draft plan will be uh, put to the public for consultation as well, and then come back to council for a final decision um, closer to the end of the, the term. Uh, thank you, um, City Manager, and and uh, to the chair. Then uh, simply, I'll keep my comments brief. In in that, with that information and the discussion we've had today, I'm I'm happy to support um, uh, this motion and the request back for information to inform the four-year capital plan. I think it's an important conversation, uh, that, uh, and I look forward to that as well as other conversations around um, both the renewal and new infrastructure that's necessary uh, for our city and to make it livable. Uh, so thank you to Councillor Carr. Thank you, Councillor Dominato and uh, Councillor Carr. I do see Councillor Swanson on the queue. If you'd like to, um, I, thank you, um, thank you for for um, preempting what, what what was going through my head. However, I'd forgotten it was so early this morning. I sent in an amendment. It is to correct a typo in the final motion. So um, uh, you all would have received it around nine thirty. 
um, this morning. And uh, it is just that in the, the first, therefore, be it resolved, Clause A, um, I mistakenly typed in 2023 to 2027 capital plan. If we know it's a 2026 plan, I don't think I need to say more. No, that's great. But I will move us to an amendment queue just to be in line with the process, although this is a fairly simple amendment. Uh, anybody to speak to the amendment? And seeing none, I'll ask that we go to a voting screen. And Councilor Dominato? Yeah. Okay, great. So that passes. Thank you very much uh, for that edit, Council Carr. We'll go back to the main queue. And if you'd like to, uh, I can advance Councilor Swanson. Go ahead, Councilor Swanson. Yeah, I just want to say that I think this is a really important motion. Um, climate is super important, and this will help us get the information we need to proceed with allocating what we need to allocate to that. And um, yeah, thanks for doing it to Councilor Carr. Great, thank you very much. Um, and Councilor Carr, closing on your motion. Great, thanks so much. Um, you know, first of all, I just want to thank the speakers who who came to actually address us. It, it was a uh, um, there was a lot of excellent points made, and I think very clear um, a sense of support for this. Um, I particularly uh, appreciated um, uh, uh, the uh, the comments made by Peter McCartney uh, that this capital plan will make or break progress um, on our addressing our climate emergency. Um, I think that's true. That's why I put forward the motion. There is a, a real urgency um, that has become more prominent and I think more top of mind uh, and more pressing for all of us um, in terms of the events, the climate related events that we experienced over the past year, um, the heat dome, the polar vortex, the atmospheric rains, the, you know, tornadoes, I mean, it's, uh, you know, the wrecking of our seawall. It's, uh, it's a scary time, really. Um, and it will be much, much worse if we do not address the climate crisis by bringing down our greenhouse gas emissions um, as rapidly as we can. Uh, the reason I felt it was important to bring this forward is because uh, we got news at the um, sort of, I guess, mid-fall, October or November, um, from staff saying that we are not on track to meeting our greenhouse gas emission reductions. In other words, our climate targets that are so essential to avoiding the worst of climate outcomes. Um, and part of that was insufficient funding. We didn't vote for the kind of funding that, we, that was needed, um, they felt, to bring forward uh, the actions to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And so um, uh, it's one of the reasons that I moved forward with, uh, with a motion into our operating budget. The capital plan motion here is to be the corollary to that operating budget. Um, and I think it's essential, as I say, to putting enough money in uh, to actually achieve those reductions that we know we must do. And those reductions are not just about greenhouse gas emission. Um, they are about also making sure that there is a sort of just and socially equitable approach to our climate actions. So you'll see those points in the actual motion. Um, the emphasis on things like retrofitting the affordable housing, um, the uh, uh, child cares, and community centers, and um, libraries, and other facilities that are publicly owned that can serve throughout the city as places of safe, safe refuge, um, which, as the doctor who spoke said to us, was a real problem for the people during the heat dome last summer. Um, and my hope is that um, that the discussions we have when when staff brings the, uh, the, the points forward and the suggestions forward um, will be not just around what would we choose, but the effectiveness of the things we fund. So that's why I've put in um, some robust reporting. If we put this much money into this, what is it going to mean in terms of actual GHG reductions at what cost? Um, and then report back to the public. Because what we also learned from our staff this past year is that public is deeply concerned about the climate crisis, but not very aware of what needs to be done and the effectiveness 
of measures that we might undertake as a city. So those kinds of report backs, I think, will go a long way to building some real solid, solid support um, for our capital plan and our spending in the city um, to, to achieve our climate emergency objectives. Thank you, Councillor Carr. And I do see Councillor Kirby Young on the queue. Go ahead, Councillor Kirby Young. Yeah, thanks. I was just compelled um, in listening to my colleagues to provide just one um, sort of additional comment. And it's music to my ears to hear that we're going to have a more fulsome, um, critical conversation around not just investing for the sake of it, but doing it because we're going to get a bigger return on it. And I think that that guiding principle is a really good one. And those are the kinds of discussions that council needs to have over where we can best um, affect outcomes. And so for example, we know that buildings are, <coughs> sorry, my voice is cracking out. We know that buildings are about 60%, um, give or take of the GHGs in the city of Vancouver. Um, and that's something we have the most influence over. And so I think I've asked that question before is where we, can we get the biggest bang for our buck, so to speak, um, in terms of the climate impact to be most effective and where should we, perhaps not prioritize in favor of some of those bigger impacts um, as opposed to trying to do it all. Where can we actually um, have the most effective outcomes? So I am actually really glad to hear some alignment starting to come from, from Council around balancing how we use our dollars really well um, and asking those critical questions and determining projects for that nature. So I'm glad to hear that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Kirby Young. Seeing no further comments um, from councillors on the queue, we'll go to a vote on the amended motion. And that motion passes with unanimous support. That concludes uh, item six on the agenda. And the standing committee portion of this meeting is now complete. So we will convene in council with Mayor Stewart as chair to deal with the recommendations and actions from today's committee meeting. Thanks very much, Chair. We're going to convene in council to deal with the recommendations and actions today. Uh, Clerk, can we have the uh, roll call, please? Um, Mayor Stewart in the chair. Councillor Carr. Here. Councillor Diginova is on medical leave. Councillor Fry. Here. Councillor Swanson. Here. Councillor Hardwick. Councillor Weeb. Present. Councillor Boyle. Present. Councillor Dominato. Uh, absent. Councillor Bly. Present. And Councillor Kirby Young. You have quorum, Mayor Stewart. Thanks very much. Uh, we need a motion to adopt the standing committee's recommendation for items two to six. I have a mover. So moved. Thank you, Councillor Weeb. Seconder? Second, Councillor Black. Second, Councillor Carr. Thank you, Councillor Carr. Uh, all in favor, say yay. 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 Opposed, nay. Thanks so much. That carries unanimously. Uh, motion to adjourn. Anyone? So moved. Sure. Thanks, Councillor Wayne. Second, uh, second Councillor Carr. Thanks very much. Uh, all in favor, yay. Yay. Opposed, nay. Yay. Hear no nays. So the meeting's adjourned. Thanks so much, everybody, for all your work. Nine council Thank meetings. You. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Great. Thanks, staff. Bye-bye. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, staff.